Hey, this is Daryl. And Taylor. With a preamble, not even a preamble, sort of introduction to today's show. Yeah. Do not skip. This information is important. There are no advertisements in this uh, introduction. <laughs> so what you're, what you're about to hear is um, a pretty long Total Soccer show. I think it's yep. going to be about two hours in all. Uh, we start off by talking about the Jonathan Gonzalez news that Hercules Gomez broke on his show. We definitely get into that. But then we give our sort of review and opinions and analysis yep. of the U.S. Soccer Presidential Forum that took place for the U.S. Youth Soccer Council in Philadelphia um, just a few days ago. Mm-hmm. So we want to just say at the top that we essentially we do a pro-con on all eight candidates. We're pretty forthright in our opinions. So you, if you're a fan of a particular candidate or you support a particular candidate mm-hmm. or you work for a particular candidate, we're aware there might be people you know, on a certain candidate's team. Yep. Don't think that we are sort of uh, going after your person because we do I think we do a balanced job of the pros and cons of every single person yeah. running. I mean, and like full disclosure, I definitely say I thought two candidates did better in these. I'm going to call it a debate because that's the easiest way to phrase a it's presidential a forum. Forum. It's a forum. But I thought two did better than the others. But mm-hmm. that doesn't mean I necessarily think they're the best candidate. Yep. I really I can't say with any level of confidence who the best candidate is or who the worst candidate so is. So I think that's the caveat we want to put on this mm-hmm. is the Quite strong and heated opinions we yep. end up expressing on this show, which we stand by, mm-hmm. um, are the result of us watching the forum and reading the various interviews and platforms of the candidates. But we're still very aware that we don't know what has been said behind closed doors, what other conversations have happened. Right. So that's why we can't give a confident opinion on who should be the next president of USA. I mean, Daryl definitely got a big check from Don Garber when I wasn't around. Yeah, yeah. But no, I get one of those every week. Aside from that, no, I mean, there is no other reason for us to be doing this aside from we were there. And we got audio of it, and we felt like we've had a lot of requests from people saying, yep. are you going to talk more about the candidates and the election? Here this it is. is us talking about <laughs> it based on the platforms and speeches they presented and gave in that forum. Okay. Is that enough caveat on with the show? I would say my final point would be that like, if you have a differing opinion on what we've said, if you felt like you heard something that we might have missed – I would like to hear that because I would like to have the most fully formed opinion of all of the candidates yes. possible before the election happens. So the candidates weren't open to a debate, but we are. Yeah. With the addendum that I'm not really into a debate either because a debate implies that like I am backing one candidate and I have this really strong opinion. <laughs> I really don't have that a strong discussion. of opinions. I have some ideas based on what I heard, but I am not mm-hmm. backing anybody, nor am I going to endorse anybody because I don't feel like I have the authority or knowledge or insight to do that. So Twitter and email may be a civil discussion. That'd be what, ideal. Is what we would That'd be, be ideal. in favor of. Okay. Should we, uh, should we get on with the show? I guess we should. On with the show. Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove. I'm back in Richmond. Also back in Richmond, Taylor Rockwell, across the table from me. Hello. Hello. It's good to be back, right? It is. Good to be back. Good to see my wife. Good to see my dogs. All that other stuff. Weird to not walk down the street and run into famous soccer players <laughs> yes. and famous figures <laughs> in the soccer community. So identical for me, except a dog singular, not plural. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so it's good to be back in studio. Mm-hmm. We have a lot to talk about. Do we? We are going to be talking about the U.S. Soccer Presidential Forum that happened in Philadelphia Mm -hmm. at the convention. We're going to go through every candidate, a little clip of audio from each candidate. That was going to be all that happened on today's show. Mm -hmm. But then then. Max and Herc released a podcast. Yes. (laughs) Yes. So big, big news, Taylor. Mm -hmm. You spotted it first. I'm going to turn it over to you. We have to talk about this first. Sure. Uh, Hercules Gomez uh, teased it on Twitter earlier today in the podcast, essentially came out publicly that U.S. soccer, at least Thomas Rongen, had never visited Jonathan Gonzalez's home, as he had claimed. Yes. Thomas Rongen uh, admitted that uh, when, uh, I think, when contacted by Hercules Gomez. Uh, meanwhile, the Mexican Federation very much contacted him. So it seems like this is indeed a case, as you and I thought, of maybe U.S. soccer not being on the same page. Uh, some folks did contact him, other ones did not. But it seems like there was not a unified message, whereas for Mexico, there certainly was. So my understanding is that Hercules Gomez essentially did some journalism work, right? Yeah. He made the phone calls to Jonathan Gonzalez, to Jonathan Gonzalez's family, to I think Thomas Rongan. I think he called Jonathan Gonzalez's family. His family relayed the messages to Jonathan Gonzalez. Yes, mm-hmm. and also to, to Tab Ramos. 
Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. so he did all the legwork. It seems like now we really do have the full picture of how much he was contacted, like even like how many text messages, how many emails and who's yeah. from. All the information is there on the Max and Hook show. Indeed. So you can listen to that one, the abbreviated yes. version. I we think don't want to steal the info, right? No, it starts around like the 44th minute of that podcast. It's mm-hmm. also an in-depth interview with Bob Bradley. That's worth listening to as oh, well. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a big show. But we, we're going to have reactions to this, right? Because um, essentially there was some um, opposite of truth <laughs> coming out here. Yeah. I you know mean, if, if you want to start... I was trying not to say lies, but that's what it was. I mean, it's lies. Yeah. It is absolutely lies. Uh, it, and it's not taken out of context. It was Thomas Rungan. Uh, the clip that I have seen is from CBS Sports. You can find that video where he says, I went to his house three times. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, he, he's as American as they come. That was part of that whole uh, monologue from mm-hmm. Thomas Rungan. And, and what, what he'd actually done is talked to the people at Monterey. He talked to representatives of Monterey. I think the implication was that he had gone there, but that might have well been over the phone. Who knows? Because once you lie like that, Mm -hmm. it means that we can't really trust what you're saying. And then the the phrase used on Max and Herc was Mm -hmm. CYA. Yeah. Cover your ass. Yeah. It seems like that is what Thomas Rungan was doing, and that's what U.S. soccer is doing. And I think the maybe one of the most damning aspects of that is that that is such an obvious lie that it, like Jonathan mm-hmm. Gonzalez's family is going to say, no, you didn't. We recognize the tall guy with an accent and a bow tie who came yep. here or didn't come here. Mm-hmm. That was what uh, Hercules yeah. Gomez. Rungan is very distinctive. Yeah, Hercules Gomez followed up and said, like, are you sure there's no way he came? To which Gonzalez's father said, I would remember if a man came to my home. <laughs> and what, I know what bow ties look like. And what that means to me is that Rungan either in the moment just panicked or. That's my guess. Or thought, oh. no one's going to check this. No one has the way to check this. No one. This kid is now playing for Mexico. Everyone's going to lose interest and say, oh, he's a Mexican player now. Who cares? Mm-hmm. He chose to be with Mexico and just thought nobody was going to do the follow-up. And when somebody did, he had to admit it. And weirdly, to me, the worst thing in this is not Thomas Rongan maybe sort of panicking, mm-hmm. telling a non-truth to sort of CYA. Um, it's the Richie Williams story. Yes. So uh, you, I think you have the details. Correct me if I'm wrong. But when, when Gonzalez was 14 or so, after yep. the Alianza thing, mm-hmm. he got some offers to go to Mexican teams. Yep. Or he could have gone to Bradenton, the U17 residency program. Richie Williams, who was then the U17 coach, he's now been replaced by John Hackworth, called him up and said, uh, are you going to come to the residency program or are you going to go to Mexico Make your mind up in 10 minutes. It, it, was, a little, it was a little more nuanced than that. From what okay. I remember, it was that he called them up, I believe the time it was 7 p.m. I remember and, that. And yeah. basically, I think, extended the offer to join the residency program at that time. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if he was aware that Gonzalez already had offers from other okay. Mexican clubs. And then when the family said, you know, this is a big decision, can we have some time to think about it? He the, said, you have 10 minutes or I'm calling the next person. I mean, I remember, I remember the, on the show they said that uh, he said, I've got some offers from Mexican clubs. Can I have you know, a day to think about this? Yeah. Right? So, yeah. yeah. 10 minutes and I'm calling the next person mm-hmm. to a 14 year old kid and his family to decide his own future. That is not fair. That is not how you sort of reach out and appeal to kids and make them feel part of US soccer, not with ultimatums to teenagers. Well, and then the other aspect of that is that uh, their belief, their being Gonzalez's family, is that that then soured Richie Williams on Jonathan Gonzalez, which explains then why he was not included in the U17 World Cup, which mm-hmm. again further soured him on US soccer. And remember, Weston McKenney mm-hmm. also not called up by Richie Williams for the U17 yep. World Cup. And those are the, you know, those two mid Fielders that have become above and beyond, mm. maybe Tyler Adams as well, become above and beyond for the U.S. national teams in, in the past. Yes. In the future, sorry. Uh, so Hercules Gomez then, uh, he, I guess, did get confirmation that Bruce Arena had sent an email mm-hmm. to Jonathan Gonzalez's family. You're on our radar? Great. Yeah. Uh, and did have some communication with Tab Ramos at varying times, including, I think it was either a conversation or a text conversation in which Tab Ramos said, if I were in charge of the national team, you would have been called in. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm inclined to think that, number one, that was Tab Ramos maybe starting starting to lay some seeds for the possibility of becoming the senior men's national team coach. Which we asked him about at the live show. Uh-huh. And number two, and I don't think this is bias. I don't know why I would be biased. Um, but I think it was maybe also indicative of the situation with U.S. soccer that I think Tab Ramos was essentially the overworked person who was in charge of a bunch of different aspects and doing everything he could. And when this decision came through, I think he was the one who ended up getting the blame. I'm not sure he's the one who deserves that blame. Are you sure we're not just like covering for Tab Ramos because, you know, he came on our live show and, you know, we, he, it was very kind of him to do so? I don't know. I really don't. I, I think it's just that the I got the feeling that Tab Ramos was put into a position where he was maybe forced to say, yeah, I guess Thomas Rongan did that. Because mm-hmm. when pressed by Hercules Gomez, he said, yeah, I was surprised that the U.S. Soccer Federation would have sent somebody down there, let alone three times. Wow. Because at that point, he thought he was the only person communicating with Jonathan Gonzalez. So maybe it is me wanting to believe in Tab Ramos, but I, I still just think that 
that second part of the quote speaks to the lack of organization from U.S. soccer. And I do think that especially after the Trinidad debacle, where maybe there just was nobody in charge, that Ramos was trying to steer the ship as best he could and keep all of these different prospects kind of in consideration. Did he do a good enough job? I don't think so, because here we are. But I think he did what he could. Okay, so I think we shouldn't give away too many details. There's mm-hmm. more to find out if you listen to yeah. the Max and Hook show. We don't want to kind of steal all the information, right? Yeah. Thoroughly recommend going and listening to that. Do you have any more sort of reactions to that before we move on well, to the U.S. soccer presidential forum? I won't go into the, the specifics, but uh, Hercules Gomez also lays out what Mexico did to recruit Jonathan yes. Gonzalez, and it is a very different story. Mm-hmm. And it is It's what um, we should be doing. Well, I'm going to say it's what we said the U.S. Soccer Federation should have been doing. It was mm-hmm. a sustained effort as opposed to, hey, I sent him an email. Isn't that good enough? Yeah, yeah. I called my mom a week ago. That means <laughs> I called her last. I'm the good son. Right. <laughs> I'll let FG know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so are you ready to move on? Uh, I am. Because uh, I think this issue kind of yeah. informs the what the dysfunction at U.S. Soccer essentially has caused us to lose this like potentially great player. Agreed. So we should talk about changes in U.S. soccer going forward. I agree completely, but I do want to say we've had some people say, like, who cares? This kid has chosen to play for Mexico. Why are you still talking about this? And Mm -hmm. I think it's for what you just said. It's not, let's rehash this because it's painful. Let's rehash this for some sort of, like, self-flagellation. It's because... There are problems within U.S. soccer that I think we did not see, mm-hmm. and that and this is slowly, emblematic of this. Yeah, right? yes, they're slowly absolutely. coming to light that I think need to be brought further into mm-hmm. light so they don't happen again. And one of the words that was used was the arrogance mm-hmm. of U.S. soccer, and yep. I think that's also a word that some uh, youth clubs would use. Agreed. <laughs> okay, so we were at the U.S. Soccer Youth Council. A U.S. Soccer Presidential Candidate Forum. Mm-hmm. Can you explain, Taylor, exactly what that means? Because it's quite a long title. Yes. Uh, it was essentially an opportunity for all eight of the uh, U.S. Soccer Presidential Candidates mm-hmm. to give their like talking points, their answers to certain questions. We'll talk more about that format yep. in just a second. To members of the uh, youth voting block, essentially. Yes. Uh, and I think initially it had been proposed as an eight-person debate. Yes. The rumors we heard were that certain... Candidates did not want to do that. I'm mm-hmm. thinking I can guess one of them at least. <laughs> um, and so what it ended up being was each candidate individually giving their individual remarks. Yep. And why was it important though, that it was the U.S. Youth Soccer Council? Because they get about 25% of the vote yes. roughly uh, in the coming election. So we will do a whole other show where we break down how all the voting works, right? Mm-hmm. But essentially, there's an athlete council yep. that gets 20% of the vote for president. Then there are three councils, the Youth Soccer Council, the Adult Soccer Council and the professional council, they get about 25% each. And mm-hmm. then there's 5% left over for like life members and various things like that. Right? Five ish percent. Yeah, miscellaneous five ish percent, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So essentially, the youth council that they were talking to, um, how many um, associations were there that could vote? 54 state organizations. And then that doesn't include uh, AYSO or US Club Soccer, who are each well represented. Yeah, okay. So that, I mean, 25% of the vote is a big, big chunk. Mm-hmm. It's, what you, it's one of the things you'll need to win this election, right? Yeah. Especially for the candidates that maybe won't get votes from the professional council which right. is you know like majority made up of uh, mls owner votes right nine so, mls votes three usl three nwsl one yeah. nasl so you can really argue that like kathy carter and carlos cordero as mm-hmm. the more businessy candidates will probably get the mls votes on the professional council i would argue that yeah and maybe eric winaldo will get the nasl vote mm-hmm. yeah um, and even though that doesn't sound like many votes combined those are multiplied to represent 25 percent of the vote as well mm-hmm. so there really are votes to be had for those other candidates with the U.S. Youth Soccer Council. Yes. Uh, so before we get into the actual yeah, individual I'm candidates, to go I'm going to say I have a theory for how this might play out. Uh, a very rough theory based mm-hmm. on not a lot other than speculation. Um, but we will get to that later on. First, we want to get into some of the actual spe- specifics from yes. each of the candidates. So, OK, so it was in Philadelphia. It was in mm-hmm. the, a gigantic room, a really, really gigantic room. And that gigantic room was more or less full. Mm-hmm. I want to stop here to just give a shout out to Kevin McCauley. Agreed. Because without, if we hadn't run into him in the hallway, yep. we would have been late to this event and we would have been locked out. Thank you, Kevin, for persuading us to go early and yeah. get a good seat. Because a lot of the events were sort of like... Oh, you, Kevin of SB Nation, by the way. Yes. You walk in as the event's beginning or two mm-hmm. minutes before, there's plenty of seats. You sit down. You're good to go. This one was separate area, go through security. And then I think they ended up locking it because the room was at capacity. So if we'd gotten there when we planned to, we probably wouldn't have been allowed yep. in, wouldn't have gotten the audio that you're about to hear. We got some great audio, made some good sure notes. Did. We've re-listened to a bunch of it as well. So I think we've got... Made you know, eye contact with a couple of the candidates. Yeah, that I, was I think uh, intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got sort of pros and cons from each candidate. And maybe an, we have got an audio clip for each one that yep. represents a thing that they said. Can we quickly explain the format? 
maybe to people who don't know about it. Sure. Um, it was JP Delacamera. Do you think you can do a better job than JP Delacamera? I mean, with all due respect, yes, because I don't think you'd read the questions uh-huh. and the intonation the first couple of times around was weird, right? I would also say in his defense, it was <laughs> respect a, to JP, but you know, it was a ludicrous format as well. So each <laughs> it was candidate like half game show. It was. It was. I was not a fan. Yeah. Uh, the format was each candidate was allowed to give opening remarks. Mm-hmm. I think each candidate had a set fifty minute time period. Yep, yep. So opening remarks, then three questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, they knew the questions ahead of time, so yep. they were allowed to prepare their answers to three questions. Then there were two questions at least thereabouts, depending on how long you talked, drawn out of a bowl <laughs> that JP De La Camera would then read to you. The candidate generally was allowed to draw that piece of paper. Yep. But then JP Della Camera... You see their faces when they drew out the, uh, yeah. the, the sort of wild card question. Mm-hmm. You could see it was the one they wanted. Yep. Or if it was a question, they were like, oh, no. And you had I a couple times. about this. You also had a couple times where they would be talking about like the importance of ODP, and then the question they would draw on was, can you discuss the importance of ODP? <laughs> so you did have some repetition uh, there. I think it was just laughable to me because, again, those first three questions were the same every time. Mm-hmm. And he had to ask them every time. And you could just tell him. He did Christopher Walken it a little bit, right? Yeah, he Mix did. up the internet. He tried. He tried. <laughs> so just so everybody knows, is it worth just giving a quick idea of what mm-hmm. those three questions were? Remember, this is the youth council. Yeah. This is very much youth council uh, related. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the first question was sort of, um, how would the relationship between the U.S. Youth Soccer State Associations, which is what makes up the youth council, um, the relationship with U.S. soccer, how would that change going forward um, under your presidency? Second question was... Um, sort of how would you align the various U.S. youth soccer organizations and the federation? Because there are obviously lots of different youth organizations that are sometimes pulling in different directions. So it's essentially about how would you bring all those together mm-hmm. to work with the federation. Third question was about the Development Academy. Mm-hmm. It was essentially, in your opinion, what's the effectiveness of the Development Academies? And what changes would you make to the sort of Development Academies and the relationship therein? So quick, quick side note. Development academies are these sort of U.S. soccer sort of set up special academies. All MLS teams have a development academy that essentially pull up the most elite players. Really um, popular, really popular. In the not room. popular with uh, coaches and administrators yeah. of youth clubs that are not development academies because they take their best players. Oh, I was not, joking. Not popular with high school coaches because they're not allowed to play high school. Yep. So development academy is a thing that's come down from U.S. soccer and has been successful over the last 10 years in some ways, right? Tyler Adams has come from there. Mm-hmm. For example, Andrew Carlton has come from there. So you can identify success stories but there's a lot of bitterness from other youth soccer coaches and not unearned by the way no the development academy was like the whipping boy of the presidential forum Mm -hmm. that if you needed to gain some points you just go (laughs) right back to it is totally failed it is wrong you guys are what's right so are you ready to start with um, our first candidate sure okay so first up it was drawn at random Mm -hmm. right so this is not our preferred order it wasn't anyone's preferred order drawn at random um, and we're going to follow the format of the event Um, first up was Hope Solo. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what would, how would you summarize what Hope Solo had to say before we play an audio clip? I would say it was a little aggressive. She attacked a couple of the candidates uh, f- with an emphasis there on mm-hmm. equality. Oh, we'll hear that in the clip. Yep. <laughs> and then a lot about how players are falling through the cracks and yep. about how basically youth soccer, specifically the development academies, have created a lot of problems within U.S. soccer. Okay, so we've got about three minutes here of Hope Solo. You ready? As many of you know, I grew up in a small farming town in the state of Washington. I never played for the top club teams in the big cities like Seattle. My family simply couldn't afford it. I played on my local teams, and I worked my way up through a system that worked. A system that gave kids a clear path to obtaining college scholarships and a higher level of play. ODP, to state team, to regional teams, to national teams. I was that diamond in a rough that through the old system, I was found. Today, I would have been missed, and today, there is another Hope Solo out there who has been already missed. What have we become? Our country was built on hope and opportunity. Yet through our failed system, we are turning our backs on the kids who can help us achieve the success that we all want. Throughout this process, There have been people who've said, I'm in this race as a publicity stunt, that I'm not here for the right reasons. To those people, I say, look in the mirror. What are you doing to ensure our best talent doesn't fall through the cracks? What are you doing to ensure every kid in America can afford to play the game? I am in this race because I cannot watch the sport I love exclude so many and fail so many. 
I have fought tirelessly for change as a player, and while change is slow and difficult, I have seen what can happen when we are united and when we demand better. I know the consensus in this room is that we need and we want change. I implore you not to fall for the false and empty political rhetoric, especially from candidates who have already been in positions to make change and did not. And I know this firsthand through our team's fight for equal pay. The United States Soccer Federation should have been the global leader in equal pay. Instead, that honor went to Norway, while we had to force it through a court system in a case that is still not resolved. The Federation, with Carlos Cordero as vice president, failed us. Kathy Carter, the highest ranking woman in soccer, stayed silent. We demanded safe playing conditions on grass-only fields, yet both candidates had a role in approving games we played on turf that injured players. They had their chance to be change makers, and they failed. So that was Hope Solo, and that was taken from her opening uh, remarks. We're mm-hmm. going to sort of pro con uh, what we heard from each candidate, not just the clip, but you know everything that we heard. Uh, Taylor, let's start with the positives. Sure. What, what did you like about Hope Solo's presentation and her answers? I wasn't surprised to hear her, like in her opening mar- remarks, lead with the equality issues. Mm-hmm. But I thought that was one of the smartest things she could have done because yeah. I think she spoke the most passionately about that of yep. any of the candidates. I agree. Uh, and uh, Bo Dure, uh, he, if you go to his timeline, he kind of covered the entire event, which is a credit to him because you and I both needed a bathroom break. He was there for the full like three hours. Um, and his opening is... Tweeting furiously, right? Yes. Yeah. And his opening, like his opening paragraph for 442, he covered this, was you can kind of throw out comments about transparency, accountability, and diversity because everybody mentioned that as sort of platitudes because they knew they had to. Mm-hmm. Not everybody went into specifics. Hope Solo did in a way that nobody else did. And I thought that was to her credit. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, mm-hmm. What about what about any other pros before we hit the cons? I mean, I mean, I thought she was very candid. I mean, a lot of other candidates had veiled references to the other candidates. Yeah. Uh, she was the only one to she name names. She named names. Yes. Uh, maybe there are reasons for that that we'll get into later on when we get to my conspiracy theory about how the way, <laughs> the way this is going to go. Um, and I thought I thought overall she she was good. Uh, she knew the format better than JP Della Camera. She <laughs> knew she was supposed to be able to give cl- concluding remarks. Yep. Uh, he did not. So then she did it really quickly. And then the person in charge said, oh, no, no, you can do it. Yeah. And I really think that if I I were a presidential candidate and somebody kind of messed up my platform, I would have been very angry. Yeah. And it's a, cr- a credit to her that she was able to collect herself to deliver those final remarks. I think she was disadvantaged uh, by being up first, yep. right? Because the format was established after that. And like JP Della Camera, Camera was more comfortable asking yep. the questions after that. Um, but she also, I felt she seemed like the most nervous of the candidates. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, she, was, she was the one who I think in her Maybe opening Maybe remarks... for the reason that she was first, but I think there's more to it than that. I might be wrong, but I believe she is the only one that like had a prepared remark in front of her. She mm-hmm. read from a podium. No one else chose to use the podium. Yeah. You could hear the nerves at time. I think at one point she forgot one of the questions and asked him to repeat it, which... Yeah. To, again, is sort of to her credit in the sense that she was honest at least and yep. didn't just try to ramble and then would have looked sort of uh, laughable had she have done that. Yeah, yeah. So re- we really we will be talking about performance because I think it matters. It like makes an impression yeah. on people, mm-hmm. but it's not the most important thing, right? This, this isn't an, a tryout for you know a role in a sitcom, for example. No, but I think uh, yes, to your point, there are other candidates as well who we'll get to who had a rough presentation, and that factors in because if you're going to be the president of UF Soccer, you've got to be able to think on your feet. Mm-hmm. You've got to be able to look presentable and, and address deli- a room and address a room yeah i think that's true she was i would say not the worst but she was definitely not one of the best in that regard in my opinion okay to the cons maybe sure um i would say that maybe the idea of just sort of uh going back to how it was which is essentially what she was arguing for like mm-hmm. before the development academies and all that came in to me is not quite detailed enough right yeah to just say it used to work better mm-hmm. we should go back to how it was i think things have changed you know hope solo is in her 30s right yeah. so her development took place like 20 something years ago mm-hmm. so you can't just roll the clock back you've got to address the reality of the new situation no and she was she was one of the candidates i forget who used this terminology so i apologize but she kind of punted on a couple things uh 
in terms of specific plans, that it was more mm-hmm. about we need to do this, we need to do that, we should be doing this, but not a clear explanation as to how we do it. U.S. soccer needs to be in an umbrella, that we need to have an umbrella approach. She did say that, yeah. Okay, how do we do that? Like, there, it was just sort of, it's We're going to hire Rihanna. It's easy to make those statements. Uh, or the evil company from Resident Evil, I'm assuming she didn't mean that. Uh, but to not have, like, a lot of specifics mm-hmm. available to deliver to these candidates or excuse me, to these voters, I thought was interesting. So my other pro for this, though, mm-hmm. is she at least was just very forward about equality for the women's team, mm-hmm. right, in a way that no one else is. Yeah. And even if she loses this election, mm-hmm. um, and you notice when she did, when she said, um, put, people say this is a, like a... She a didn't deny stunt, it. She didn't deny it. I think she meant to. I think maybe it was badly written, so yeah. she didn't say it is not that. Yeah. But even, even if it isn't, then I think the long run of her candidacy will be to bring... Uh, the U.S. Women's National Team and the issues uh, like pay and like the quality of the fields to the fore so that everybody else has to address it so that it eventually ends up in the winner will eventually have to have that yeah. as part of their platform. I think you so. know what I'm saying? And the thing of kids falling through the cracks. I mean, everybody talked about that, so it's not so unique to her. Yeah. Not to harp on this issue, but like we talked about with Sunu Gulati, his joke about they say I'm a lousy politician. My joke was for being a lousy politician, you're a very good politician. Mm-hmm. That is part of it. You do have to be a good politician. And to your point, yeah, I think it was probably probably supposed to be something like to people who say this is a publicity stunt i'm not going to dignify that with a response or like you know a defense because it's such a laughable suggestion but i would say look at yourself in the mirror Mm -hmm. but to say to people who say this is a publicity stunt look at yourself in the mirror yeah doesn't quite convey that level of uh rejection it just wasn't perfectly worded no and and again i think that goes to that she is used to extemporaneous speaking Mm -hmm. she's used to speaking her mind when asked to speak her mind to maybe deliver prepared remarks not necessarily her strength I would agree with mm-hmm. that. And then there's other, so there's another big issue hanging over her. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily part of her presentation, mm-hmm. but it's part of what people will consider when they're voting for her. I mean, uh, yes. And I, I, I think I'm correct in saying that if Eric Wanalda had domestic violence charges hanging over his head or, t- excuse me, domestic assault, I forget, two assault charges, misdemeanor assault charges, that would be enough to throw serious question marks onto his campaign mm-hmm. in a way that it kind of hasn't for her. It's, it's been it hasn't the elef- been a feature, right? It ha- it's been the elephant in the room. No one has talked about it. In her one-on-one session, she talked about the uh, coward's comment in relation to Sweden and a little bit about being so outspoken in the past. Mm-hmm. But that's something that no one has really attempted to broach as far as I've seen. But still and it in, seems it's like still, it should have been. It's still in the court system mm-hmm. in the state of Washington, It correct? is indeed. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, that's definitely a big negative mark. And then my final thing I had is that she got some of her facts wrong. And I don't think you can do that. Yeah. She talked about like the licensing and how if you get an F license, you can coach anybody from six to 18. That's not true. Uh, And then some of the other... What is true? Do you know? I think it's like it is currently the what they're bringing in or have already brought in is that you have to like the farther up you go the older age group you're allowed to coach at a higher level as well so i I think the point was like yeah you might be able to coach like u18 at rec level but with an f license you can't coach yeah yeah you know a u18 development academy (laughs) and then i think also her plan to have it be like age appropriate coaching so from six six to eight it's about the fundamentals and then from nine to ten i think ayso already does that okay so there were some flaws in there uh, that weren't strangely weren't as big for me but again when you don't have the strong like specific plan to back those up or to kind of alleviate some of those they stand out more as a result okay so there's hope solo mm-hmm. at our pros and cons um, before we move on to the next candidate today's show is sponsored by blue apron Here's why Blue Apron would be a great candidate. Why is that? So not only are they they the number one fresh ingredient delivery service in the country, um, it all comes in one big box, Mm -hmm. perfectly packaged, a perfectly packaged candidate with very specific instructions and all the ingredients inside. Step by step shows you how to get the job done once you take it out of the box. I say vote Blue Apron. It's specific plans (laughs) that you can follow easily. They make sense. They end in a a good product. That's nice. I will say that I think when you choose Blue Apron, you have eight options of yep. which you're allowed to choose three. <laughs> and I kind of think that's where this election is going. So that seems fitting as well. They have plans you can choose from. The mm-hmm. two-person meal plan, the family meal plan, or the wine plan. Mm-hmm. I've just checked my notes here and it's actually 12 new recipes even to more choose candidates. from each week. So more candidates than yeah. even U.S. soccer has. And if people would like to choose Taylor, how would they do so? 
Well, Daryl, Blue Apron is treating uh, the Total Soccer Show listeners to $30 off their first order if they visit blueapron.com slash TSS. So check out this week's menu. I'll take care of it, sir. And get your $30 (laughs) off with free shipping at blueapron.com slash TSS. Can I do the last bit? You can. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. All righty. Thank you to Blue Apron for sponsoring today's show. Thank you to candidate Kyle Martino for being the next candidate up onto the stage. He wins best dressed, right? Yeah, I think Carl so. Carl Martino wins mm-hmm. best dressed. Yep. Um, what stood out, before we play the audio clip, what stood out to you about Carl Martino's uh, presentation? Uh, I thought, number one, he grew into it. I think he started yes. a little bit nervous. I think most of the candidates started nervous. He grew into it, became very charismatic by the end, mm-hmm. got a couple jokes in there, got a Shakespeare reference. I know you he appreciated did. that. He was the only candidate to, re- to have a Shakespeare reference. Yes, I think he was probably he'll get, very... He'll get John Talbot's vote if Talbot yeah. was voting. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, he drew the uh, question about diversity, which I think he was pleased with because it allowed him to hit Jonathan yes. Gonzalez. And actually, that's what the audio clip will, yes. will mention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And um, the arrogance that U.S. soccer maybe had in approaching Jonathan Gonzalez. I would also say Carl Martino was the only candidate that was handing out his manifesto um, as you came up the escalator. And this is a smart presentation move, at least. He had a youth soccer club that he works with. Mm -hmm. Uh, those kids were out there handing out his manifesto. That's yes. a strong visual message, and you have all his information, uh, his platform, to hand as you're sitting there. I would say it's the most specific plan, and I would say some of these most specific details. I'd say he was Agreed. one of two candidates with those types of details. So should we take a listen to a Carl Martino audio clip? Let's do. And I, I didn't have much diversity in my town. You know what, what gave me diversity? And you know this, one of my best friends, Edson Buttle, soccer. Yeah. Soccer showed me the world. I got to fly all over the world and see that it, the world was not Westport, Connecticut. Uh, and the world is beautiful. Our country is beautiful. It's multicultural. And my entire career, I didn't have a Spanish-speaking coach. I mean, how on earth is that possible in a country where, where we have so many players that come from these incredible cultures and these backgrounds that are predisposed, many of them, to love this game. So um, the, the Jonathan Gonzalez example is a high-profile one. Of We had a player that we blamed for playing for another country. I mean, how arrogant is that as, uh, for, for us as a nation to say, that's his fault. You know, you've got to love the crest. Why would he love the crest if at, at, at a young age it meant nothing to him? Because we didn't go in his community and say, this is about health, it's about wellness. And in the Latino community, obesity is a, is a serious problem. So this is bigger than winning World Cups and making sure players put on our jersey. It's about boy, you know, boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. It, it, it needs to mean something to be a part of this membership. And if you play it at the local level, high school rec, you mean as much to the membership as the person that's, that's on the TV playing in a World Cup. You're, you're the same thing. So we need to hire a, a, a director with the experience, the nows, and the culture to help us get into these communities and, and offer membership that means something to them. I've reached out to Hercules Gomez and Hugo Perez and, and, and people that are frustrated because no one's asked for their help, and they've offered it. Um, Jonathan Gonzalez just needed a phone call. That's all he needed. We were so wrapped up in our World Cup bids and our election that no one thought, has anyone called Jonathan and said, you know what, you're a fantastic player. Um, we really hope that you choose us because you are, you are us. And, and we, need a, we need a board, we need a federation, and we need a team that's representative of this country. I mean, we're, we're a country of women and men and, and different religions, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, dual nationals. Our board should look like that. Our team should look like that. And, and if we don't have a department focusing on that, how do we expect to get there? All right, so that's Kyle Martino. Daryl, since I went first with Hope Solo, why don't you tell us some of your pros for Mr. Martino? So maybe we'll get to the diversity thing that he, sure. he highlighted, but he was also fortunate to draw that question, right? To, so he could address diversity, as we mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I liked about his presentation and his ideas is the, the idea of the listening tour that he went on. Yeah. And then he's got this sort of policy of taking ideas from the bottom up to filter up through state associations mm-hmm. to U.S. soccer. So essentially, he's essentially inverting what's been happening for the past few years. I think that's going to be a popular platform with the U.S. Youth Soccer Council. Yes. Fair? And I think similar to Hope Solo, he kind of hit on the strengths right away to mm-hmm. differentiate himself because he's already done the listening tour in a way that maybe some of the other candidates have Yes, met. absolutely. Um, so the, another pro, uh, it's not mentioned um, at the Youth Soccer Council because maybe it's not as relevant to them, although mm-hmm. it still entered uh, another candidate's uh, presentation, was the he has a specific plan for promotion relegation, right? The Pro Rail 2030. Mm-hmm. We criticized it a little bit. It's, it's in his manifesto. We criticized it a little bit, but he, I think he's the first 
candidate, the only candidate, I may be wrong, that actually lays out, here's the timeline of how it would happen. And I think that's worth considering that nobody else has actually said, you know, this year we do this, this year we do this, yeah. this is the pathway to pro rel. No, I think you're correct. Uh, I know other candidates mentioned it. Uh, and I want to say I'm not just being vague with saying other candidates. Mm-hmm. It's just when I have specific examples, I will give them outside yeah. of that. It's, you know, I'm not trying to say somebody said something they didn't. <laughs> but with Martino, I think that's why I, I would say a pro for him is that he's like an outsider without being too outside. Yes. That he's not... He hasn't been on the board. He's not with uh, Soccer United Marketing. He is his own thing, but he's not out there saying we need to burn it all down the way, say, Eric Winalda mm-hmm. might be saying <laughs> or implying. Yeah, it's actually – it's a lot of very specific ideas that really would change the way things work. Mm-hmm. But without saying I'm going to dismantle this house and rebuild it, it's yes. like I'm going to fix the windows. I'm mm-hmm. going to fix the door. Or It's all that kind of stuff, yes. right? Yeah, um, I, th- I mean I think he knew – I mean, again, when you're talking politics, I think he played politics pretty well. I think yes. he knew how to toe the line in terms of going up to the edge of saying we're going to do this dramatic thing mm-hmm. but not overpromise and then potentially under. Deliver. He was also the only candidate that, without being prompted by a question, said, I've, on the listening tour, I've heard a lot of people's ideas. You know, I've talked to Mia Hamm and Steve Nash, and mm-hmm. I'm going to pull in. He essentially said, I don't own these ideas, mm-hmm. but I'm going to pull in all these ideas, and I'm going to make these work. I think yep. his manifesto is the same, right? It's mm-hmm. not like I sat down in front of a word duck and did this. This is like I'm pulling this in from every angle and then going to take the best ideas and make them happen. I kind of like that approach to a presidency. And again, those are smart people to go with because mm-hmm. you compare that to, say, Kathy Carter, who in her one-on-one session said that she was going to start like an independent commission to review mm-hmm. things that would be headed by Wasserman. And it's like, that's not yeah. good. You're, that's a consultant saying they're going to consult with another consultant. Yep. We'll get that's to not a great Carter way to go. Yeah. In a couple of candidates mm-hmm. time. Um, one other pro from me, um, this wasn't on stage, but mm-hmm. um, he, he has been endorsed by Street Soccer USA. Yeah. We should almost say this is a full disclosure kind mm-hmm. of thing, right? Because we coached the Richmond Street Soccer USA team. Um, he was joined there by Lawrence Can, the sort of one of the heads of Street Soccer USA. So there's definitely, if that organization is endorsing him, that can only be a positive thing. Street Soccer USA is um, an organization that does soccer for social change, mm-hmm. soccer to help end homelessness, drug addiction, um, et cetera. So he really, it seems to me that he has impressed the people at Street Soccer USA uh, with some sort of uh, commitment to sort of, uh, I want to say social justice, but, you know, using soccer for social good. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely in the pros. What have you got in the cons? Well, with the cons, I would say... Even though he has a lot of specific ideas for, um, I, I want to mention like the, the over-under thing where mm-hmm. he put goals under the basketball hoops, that kind of stuff. He has specific ideas there. His Monty using Capulets line, mm-hmm. um, which you referenced, I was impressed there with the Shakespeare reference, um, in terms of bringing all the U.S. youth soccer organizations together. He also called it a U.N., that we should have like a U.N. where we all come mm-hmm. together. It, it's not necessarily that specific, right? It's just we should all work together. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like with the Monty using Capulets, it didn't actually end that well. No. Right? <laughs> Not so much. I've read to well, the I think, end it, of I think it did, yet. I think, after two children killed themselves. Right, but yeah. yes, so, then it was a little bit more peaceful. Right. So uh, the, I don't, for me, there wasn't enough specificity in terms of, uh, in terms of that. Yeah. I agree completely. I, yeah. that's, that's my major con I have for, for him. I don't have many, if I'm being totally honest. Okay. But, but it was, again, it, it was I really wanted to hear candidates at least once or twice be very specific. Yes. And now I know, again, then worth noting that he has the manifesto. I can't claim to have read it all or have memorized it all in the mm-hmm. detail to say. I've read through it all once, but I can't. Yeah. There's, a lot of, there's a lot of words in there. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's still, again, there's just parts of me that feel like you're saying that, but maybe that's not possible. Mm-hmm. And there were a couple different candidates who promised things with the surplus. There was a lot of references to that $150 million surplus that I don't know if they're feasible. Martino didn't necessarily do that, yeah. but it still felt like there were some moments in there when it was stuff that maybe he can't deliver upon. Yeah. Or maybe he was just sort of like, I know I need to say this stuff to cover my bases. Here's what I think is working in Carl Martino's favor, mm-hmm. is that he seems to be, he's pro pro rel, uh, but he's not as aggressive as, say, Eric Winona, mm-hmm. right? And then he's also, he's kind of out ahead on this, d- despite being like the one like white kid from Connecticut, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, he's out ahead on the diversity thing, right? Like he, this Jonathan Gonzalez issue may end up benefiting him um, in the long run because it becomes a bigger issue and he's the one that has proposed like you know diversity outreach I think he literally hiring Hercules Gomez to go and uh, be an outreach mm-hmm. coordinator yeah um, and with that in mind I want to say I think part of the reason why I'm having a hard time coming up with cons is because I thought he was the best candidate of, of Ooh, these eight really I did um, I thought that he was you saw on the day or yes, in general okay. I thought he was one of two uh, two of the best candidates uh, I'll save the other one for later on 
Um, and he was not my preferred candidate heading into this convention at all. Mm-hmm. I, I really didn't think he had as much of a chance as some of the other ones. I think he has a much better shot. I think he did the most to improve his standing in a way that I was very surprised by. Uh, I, I didn't have high expectations, and maybe that factored into it a little bit. Another con, maybe, if we are looking at cons for Carl Martino, is just his sort of lack of um, administrative experience, right? Mm-hmm. So I know he's involved with youth soccer clubs, but, you know, when you compare him to, say, you know, a Steve Gans or a Michael Winograd, it's mm-hmm. not like he has run um, an association, you know what I'm right. saying? So, mm-hmm. And he hasn't, and so, I know it's like it's interesting to be an outside candidate, but he hasn't been involved on a US soccer yeah. federation mm-hmm. board, or, you know, any sort of administrative position. He's most famous and most known because he has mostly been doing working for NBC Sports. Indeed. Right? Very true. So he can analyze the Premier League, but that doesn't necessarily necessarily help his candidacy for U.S. soccer. These are facts. <laughs> These are facts. I will say, final point for me and Martino, yeah. is that I, I also think he benefited from a very favorable draw. As we said, Hope Solo was was pretty nervous and I think unfamiliar with that sort of a setting. Martino, by comparison, looked very comfortable. Mm-hmm. And then Steve Gans came, and maybe we can move <laughs> on to him. Um, and it was not very good from Steve Gans. So here's an interesting thing. Yeah. Um, I listened back to the audio, mm-hmm. and I'm about to play you an audio clip. Audio, he yep. sounds very impressive. Mm-hmm. But in the room, there's a problem. It's very much the Nixon problem, right? Yep. Steve Gans was sweating like a lot. Like, yes. Not just a little bit, but a lot. It was very obvious. It was very visible to everybody. He also got a bit of the dry mouth he going did. on. Mm-hmm. I won't do the noise because I know you hate it, but everybody, everybody can... Uh, also, you would do it into a microphone to drive people crazy. Yeah, so too. everyone yeah. can imagine what, what that sounds yes. like. Um, so, this is it. like. So the Nixon thing as well is uh, that everybody who watched that debate with Kennedy on mm-hmm. TV thought Nixon lost horribly because he was sweating profusely. Yep. Everyone who heard it on the radio thought Nixon had won because he made better points, mm-hmm. which is a really interesting sort of uh, um, analogy to this, this Steve Gans uh, presentation. Yes, except that you could hear that audible mouth noise. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe that. that wouldn't have played so well on except the radio. So shall we play? Um, oh, worth noting. No, we'll talk about that after. Let's sure. play the Steve Gans clip. And what I heard from so many presidents and EDs and board members of state associations was that... They've not been listened to anymore. They have been disrespected. They've wanted to participate for a very long time, and they're not participating. The knowledge that the states have is deep. The people in the trenches absolutely can can contribute and should contribute to the decisions that U.S. soccer makes. So the question I find interesting because they've been waiting to be included for a very long time. And, and to, to, you know, to a fairly recent time, they were, and, uh, and we want to return that. In terms of actual ideas with respect to what to do, I want to put state coaches on the youth technical working group and make that work, youth technical working group be something that's real because it's basically been a show up until now, and we want to put those state coaches on it, so and those player development initiatives, which are developed with those coaches, will be implemented from the states up. When the state associations tell U.S. Soccer that the huge attrition rate at U13, part of it is because of the birth year initiative, U.S. Soccer will listen to that. Those are the kind of dynamics we're talking about in terms of other initiatives, I think we can do a lot more with licensing of coaches so that the ratio of players to licensing coaches improves. And I think the states and the federation can work together that way as well. So hearing that audio one more time made me realize, even though he has good specific points, the presentation was not as confident as I imagined. Maybe I was just more impressed by the points because I actually heard them this time instead of just like staring at the sweat coming down his head. It was awkward. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I tweeted that at the time that like I kind of couldn't pay attention to his opening remarks because he was sweating yeah. so much. We can talk maybe more about that in just a second. Maybe we should, because least... it would be very easy to just like spend the, this segment like laughing at that, and I think that would be massively unfair to a man who was like the first to challenge Sunil Galati well, and no, who has a lot of that. ideas. Yeah. yeah, I mean, because honestly, I don't think that that is something that we're laughing about, but I mm-hmm. think it definitely needs to be mentioned, but we will in a second. First, I want to talk about what you just said. He was the first to challenge Sunil Galati. Yes, He announced That's his pro, candidacy right? before the Trinidad game, mm-hmm. well before the Trinidad game. And, I, I, and, yeah, I think if the United States qualifies for the World Cup, I think he is the only person challenging Sunil Gulati for the presidency right now. Right, that's so true. So this isn't a sort of, oh, everything has been fine. Like, or, excuse me. I think some of the candidates, it was the Trinidad game, revealed fundamental problems in U.S. soccer. I think Steve Gans has seen those fundamental problems yep. for, for a long time and 
was going to do something about them regardless of World Cup qualification. Yep, and so he's seen those problems for a long time mm-hmm. because he really has been involved at pretty much every level yep. of US soccer, youth and adult and all that, youth with his kids, mm-hmm. adult running some stuff himself. I think he played, uh, he played, he had a playing career, right? Yeah. Um, and when he gives that sort of narrative, it's always, I always find it not that interesting when he sort of lays it out and I feel like he's trying too hard to prove that he you know, was involved in the mm-hmm. game. But if you just think about it, he, if he has seen all these different levels, he is arguably the most qualified person in terms of knowing how all the different angles work and how different people feel at different levels, mm-hmm. right? And he had specific stories about uh, his son, how mm-hmm. like the de- development academy system kind of like killed the joy in the game yes. for his son. I, some people have been critical of the fact that he tends to bring up his son a lot. Yeah. But I think there's a reason if you're tosh- talking to youth coaches at a youth Youth Summit, mm-hmm. you're going to bring up your personal experience when it comes to youth soccer. Was it Steve Gantz whose son, had, he had a commitment from a college, uh, but he asked if he could forego a year in the Development Academy and play high school instead before coming to college uh, because he wanted to get his joy back for the game. I believe that is correct. Yeah, I'm yes. pretty confident it's too. We may mm-hmm. be wrong. If we are, we apologize. There's been yeah. a lot of information we're trying to sort of corral here. This is true. <laughs> okay. This is true. Um, how about cons? I mean, sure. Uh, I think acknowledging my bias... Part of this was when we talked to some of the other uh, members of the press who were there. I'm considering members of the press. We had the media badge. <laughs> they were saying, oh, we know what to expect from Steve Gans and from Michael Wanagrad. They're both lawyers. They both have business backgrounds. It's going to be to the point. It's going to be polished pr- – pr- uh, <laughs> ironic. <laughs> polished presentations. It's fine. You only do this for a living. It's That's fine. true. It's going to be polished presentations because they're lawyers, because they're to the point. Mm-hmm. So to see him – be so visibly uncomfortable in the beginning was a jarring juxtaposition. Yes. And he was the, one of only two candidates who chose not to stand, the other being Carlos Cordero, and I think both of them were the least comfortable speaking in public of any of the candidates. Yes. He, again, it wasn't just there was a little bit of sweat. If you watch Scrubs, it was Teddy Buckland flop sweat, and it was pouring down the side to the point where he must have been so uncomfortable. Yeah. And I want this to be a lesson for people. If you're ever doing a public speaking engagement, if you're ever recording audio, take the break, drink the water. (laughs) Daryl's doing it right now. It is always worth it. Winograd did that. He timed his water consumption very well. It made him sound more polished as a result. I I think all of that is true. Okay, can we get to the specific proposal that you heard? No, We can because I still want to say I'm not just trying to harp on him. I'm not making fun of him. But really it was clear. I mean, yes, they were under bright lights. I didn't see any other candidates sweating that way. And again, it's worth noting that if you're going to be the president of U.S. soccer, if you're going to be representing us on the global stage, if in your first if your first sit down meeting with Gianni H2O. Infantino you burst out sweating, does not convey confidence, does yeah. not command a room. Yeah, if you're meeting with the president of FIFA, maybe drink some water. It's a good rule of thumb. How about that? I think so. I would. Yeah. I would do it. I, I drink water just to meet with you. Also, true, you do, and also breath mint. Throw that in there too. Breath mint. I, I don't know what Steve Gans's breath smells like, but if you're meeting the president of FIFA, best to be fresh. You're an Altoid fan, right? I am not, not a sponsorship, just a fact. I've smelled enough coffee breath to know that I'm an Altoid fan. Yes. I apologize. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we should also – so you've, you've done some cons there. Yep. I think the audio clip we played mm-hmm. and his proposal therein I think counts as a pro, yep. at least in the room for those U.S. Youth Soccer Council people. Right? He proposed that um, instead of U.S. soccer coming from Chicago and coming into your state, whichever state it may be, and then identifying talent and basically showing favoritism towards development academies in terms of where the talent is, because that is the major complaint, right? Mm-hmm. That is what happens. Um, he would, um, uh, I think there is a position or we empower a position of state technical director yeah. who would be responsible for finding the very best talent in your state. Like, let's say it's Kansas, right? I'm just picking one at random. Mm-hmm. Um, the technical director would find the very best talent in the state and would just be focused on scouting this or scouting, yeah, finding talent within the state, not just in the development academy is also in the other non-DA clubs. Mm-hmm. I think then kids have a better shot of getting onto youth national teams uh, without being in development academy. Yes. I think uh, that's popular in the room. I think that will get some U.S. Youth Soccer Council votes. Agreed. Uh, and I think that like they're definitely with some of the candidates, some of their proposals were familiar to things that already exist. Mm-hmm. That's not a bad thing. That's like you're building off of a thing that they think is working, that they've yeah. identified as working. And I think that's what Steve Gantz had done from declaring his candidacy, was meeting with people, figuring out what was working and yep. building off of that. And that is why at the end of this... I thought he was maybe the most disappointing, not because of sweating or being uncomfortable, but because what I had heard going into this is, one, he knows how to speak in public. Two, he has been doing that legwork. He has the most to gain from this because he has a lot of people out there who think, yeah, he might not be the sexiest candidate, but he knows the issues. He knows the most. Yeah. And I think he whiffed a little bit in that regard. So it was like a chance to sexy it up. Yeah. He should go to Carl Martino's Taylor. 
Yeah, I think so. But he also like he he had the like negative impact of I think when he did his one on one session, I think it was the least attended because it was directly coinciding with the start of the MLS draft. So a lot of people were there covering that. It's bad timing. Mm -hmm. So I think he really had an opportunity to come out fresh in a way that a lot of people hadn't heard his ideas in that one on one session. So it would have been new and exciting. And we didn't quite get that impact. Shall we move on to the fourth candidate up on stage, sure. which was Kathy Carter. Mm-hmm. So everyone knows Kathy Carter um, was the president of Soccer United Marketing. Yep. She kind of referenced that um, in, in her presentation. For those who are unaware, Soccer United Marketing were, essentially works with U.S. soccer and works with Major League Soccer to um, – package them together and sell the rights to TV companies to theoretically bring in the most money mm-hmm. possible. Some people would say they're not doing the best possible job right now. Fair to say? Some people would say um, that. So how would you describe uh, Kathy Carter's platform, maybe in a couple of bullet points before we play her audio clip? Um, unfairly, I would say status quo, but I think that is kind of the case, that she is the one who is proposing the least amount of change. Uh, by all accounts, she is the one that Sinu Gulati wanted to succeed him as president. Mm-hmm. If, when that's the case, you can Not can't... officially, but we kind of, we kind yeah. of know, right? He, yeah. ha- he hasn't knows. endorsed anybody. He went out of his way not to talk about specific candidates to the extent possible, but it seems like that is the person that he is backing to win. Mm-hmm. And with that, you can't then say, Sinu Gulati's done a terrible job. You have to find ways around that, and I think think the way she's tried to find a way around it have not resonated or worked. For example, the Wasserman Group proposal Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier. Okay, should we play an audio clip from Kathy Carter? What's been interesting, and I'm sure you've heard from everyone, the common themes that we've all heard. Uh, But most importantly, what I have identified is that there's an opportunity. There is an opportunity for us to grasp something that I think is far out of our reach today, but something that is big and audacious and we have the ability to accomplish. I believe that we can become the greatest soccer nation in the world. It's a big idea and something that I think we can all get up out of bed and think about. But in order to do that, we have to have the best and most players, coaches, administrators, referees and volunteers. We have to have the best professional leagues and the best leagues in general. We have to have the best fan culture And most importantly, at least from a fan standpoint, we have to have teams that represent our country on all levels that dominate. But it's up to you, actually, to decide if that's a vision that we can achieve. Because it's up to us and that whoever you choose to be the leader that gives you the voice, empowers you to lead, to to do the work uh, that is required to make this big, audacious vision become reality. Uh, and that is what is so exciting about this whole, ent- this whole experience. Uh, and as I think about it, you have the power to elect a leader that will have the ability to put our women's game back on the forefront as I look not in the rearview mirror, but to the horizon of what we can be to drive opportunity, to drive diversity, and to drive change in not just our country, but in the world. Uh, so I look forward to answering the questions, picking out of the hat, and talking a little bit more about that but I encourage you to, to vote for a leader that will have the ability to mend the fences uh, that we, we all have experienced that need to be men, mended uh, so that we can continue forward in a great game that all of you spend your lifeblood, your time, and most importantly, uh, your energy to create. I believe, and I think you all believe, that we have the ability to create and to become the greatest soccer nation in the world. Can I start with the pro for Kathy yeah, Carter? Absolutely. Um, that is a great line. The greatest soccer nation in the world. It kind yeah. of it got me on the edge of my seat when I heard it and I sort of thought, how are we gonna do that? Really? Let's do that. It yeah. got you on the edge of your seat? I mean, how, why, I'd how be come? interesting. Because I'd like the I'd like the US to be the greatest soccer nation in the world, or at least joint first with England. Yeah, right. Did it keep you on the edge of your seat? I mean, no, I don't think there were enough specifics mm-hmm. afterwards. And that I guess that's my con as well, right? There weren't enough specifics about yeah. how we were gonna become the greatest soccer nation in the world. But I would say that in my head um, I guess this is a pro. I've sort of filled in the gaps of, from what I've heard from her elsewhere. And so she essentially, in her this statement you just heard, she talked about, uh, what, more coaches, the best mm-hmm. coaches, more administrators, more scouts, um, all of this stuff. 
And she never she never really explained how that was going to happen. But elsewhere, she's described that she thinks that U.S. soccer can make a lot more money. Mm -hmm. She thinks a lot more money can be pulled in by U.S. soccer. So essentially, I think she's like she's pitching herself as the business candidate, and we'll do what we're doing now, but we'll do it with a lot lot more money behind it. We'll do it bigger and better. For what she it's an appealing pitch. For what she had to do, I think she did it the best she could have done. Because this is not the room I think she's trying to win, basically. That is true. I think maybe she gets a couple votes here and there is what she's going for. I that. Yeah, she, this is almost like lost to her, right? She's like, kind of. Yeah. yeah, and the reason for that is because these are people who are saying the current system does not work. It has disenfranchised many players, clubs, coaches, parents, mm-hmm. whomever. And she is kind of saying... Well, we'll see about that. We'll establish some independent commissions to see what's not going right when they're saying, we're telling you what's not going right and you're not listening. Yeah. Then so she's it, saying more money will make all those things better. I think right? she, yeah. but she is, but then she's already seen as the candidate who's all about money and TV rights and, and maybe getting some favorable deals. Yeah. And but, so, so I but think, her pitch is just to try, like, at least like a Hail Mary yeah. to convince or a half court shot to convince them that that actually might be a good thing. Well, and I would, it didn't necessarily go. See, in. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even agree with that because I don't think she can take that Hail Mary shot because she knows that that won't be true. So I think she basically has to say, what is true for her in the most polished way possible to make yeah. it. So she can't say, we're going to make a bunch of money because she's already seen as the money candidate. Mm-hmm. But she can say, we're going to do everything we can to make U.S. soccer the best it can be. That's a thing that she definitely believes, but she can't go into too many specifics because I think it goes against what some of yeah. the people in the audience wanted. That's almost like the base layer of any pitch to be the president mm-hmm. of an organization is we're going to make everything the best it can be. Yeah. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? That should be just the starting point and then you, you map out from there how yeah. you're going to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think... I I apologize if this turns some people off, but I think that she is, in terms of this election, like the Hillary Clinton candidate. And that's not just because she's a woman, but it's because of all of kind of what goes – establishment type thing? I mean, I've got it here. Okay, basically she is the status quo at a time when maybe the status quo isn't what people want. Right. That I think she's a very good candidate in another election Mm -hmm. at another time in U.S. soccer. She's very qualified in terms of that business – acumen but again i don't know if that appeals right now i think she tried really really hard to be affable in some of these uh statements she made some jokes some of them worked some of them fell flat in a way that felt like they had been rehearsed it was very sort of uh like boardroom presentation yeah. uh jokes mm-hmm. do you know what i'm saying yes she, i think didn't, wasn't her first line when she came out was like hey is everybody tired which i yeah. feel like is a thing that you say at a convention yeah. to a bunch of people who are maybe bored, right? Mm-hmm. And I imagine a lot of business conventions, I mean, I, I've seen them. They look kind of boring. And I think you sometimes have to be there for work, right? Mm-hmm. I think maybe just we were excited to be there. But the, the U.S. Soccer yeah. Coaches Convention was kind of great, right? Everything was really yeah. engaging. You're seeing like, Spanish coaches do these amazing things and this and that. I don't think you get tired there, even if uh, soccer coaching is your life. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like a, it's a little bit of a high to be there, I think. Yeah. Because I- the room didn't say, yes, we're all tired. She's sort of like, oh. No, you're not. Well, I think I think it was also the implication there was it was the penultimate day, but the last full day of the of the thing after yeah. I think she was the fourth candidate, but we were already like an hour plus in at that mm-hmm. point. So maybe she By the tra- way, this show's gonna run long. That's and fine. We do not apologize because we cover fine. every candidate. But she made the joke about like drawing out of a hat or drawing out of a bowl that she was like, I want the green M M&M, and M in a in a joke that I think that she had like told her staff and they're like, Yeah, that's great. I have no idea what do it means. Do you get that reference? All I know is the green M&Ms when I was in middle school were the ones that supposedly made you horny. I don't know if There's, that's what she was going with. I am almost I, certain that's it not It seems weird, right? But it was like for. the green M&M was always advertised as being the sexy M&M. Isn't this like the, the thing the band did? No, nah, that, was, that was brown. Uh, that was brown M&M's. That was brown M&M's. Okay. I think it was. Uh, and that was Van Halen, okay. I, I also believe. <laughs> and little side note, that was like a test to see if the, the crew were well prepared and did everything that they'd asked. Yes. It wasn't actually because they didn't like brown M&M's. Exactly. They wanted Genius. To make, because it was about, that was the way, as I recall, that was the way you could make sure that all safety uh, yes. protocols were in place. Uh-huh. Um, but the other thing with Kathy Carter being the Hillary Clinton candidate is that she has or appears to have some like nefarious skeletons in her closet that people don't quite understand but with Soccer United marketing. She said no one understands what SUM is. Exactly. Right? This was her chance to stand on stage mm-hmm. and explain it and maybe make a pitch for yeah. it. And I yeah. don't think she did a very so, good job of it. And if she, she could have made a pitch like, this is what SUM does. Mm-hmm. This is how, um, if it was doing even better, this is how it could help you more. Yeah. She didn't make that pitch. No. Uh, and so what she did do was when it got to the problems facing them, she talked about Band-Aid solutions. Uh, first of all, yes. it's, it's adhesive strip. Band-Aid is a brand. Uh, but more to the point. Say she, that over your tannery. She, she talked about, like, we could do this or we could do that or we could do that. But is that really what we want? Do we want Band-Aid solutions? No. We want a comprehensive solution 
Next point. Yeah. And it was like, oh, you're not going to say what that comprehensive mm-hmm. solution is? So, again, it, it just felt like vagaries like, out there. It was a pitch of sort of everybody think bigger. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It was like instead of like maybe some scholarships for pay to play, think bigger. But there wasn't a real clear pitch of what the think bigger exactly mm-hmm. was. Yeah. That was nearly the clip I uh, – because I selected these clips. Mm-hmm. If you're going to blame anyone, blame me. <laughs> the thing I nearly selected was the, uh, the Band-Aid thing because then she said um, – if we just do that, we'll be back here in four years wondering why we've still got problems. Yes. Yeah. But I thought I was surprised because she started off, I thought she was, I did think she started off charming. I thought she was funny. She had the, the moment when she first sat down and her mic pack was like pressing up against her bra. And yeah, she talked about like, back, this, right? yeah. Yeah, like, I'm uncomfortable. I need to adjust. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, I thought that was a very human moment. As did, and, yeah. I, as did I. But I think as it went on and she kind of failed to say things that really registered and then continued to make little jokes that mm-hmm. were aimed at being funny. It felt more programmed than okay, anything else. One thing I think we should maybe focus mm-hmm. on is, or rather, we shouldn't focus too hard on just what was said at this forum, sure. right? Because this is the first time we're really going through every candidate mm-hmm. and talking about them. Yeah. It's still true that Kathy Carter has a very good chance of winning this election. Because we mentioned Absolutely that she, she almost certainly, but not officially, but almost certainly, has the support of Sunil Galati from US Soccer right now and Dan Garber from Major League Soccer. That means she probably gets most of the votes from the professional council, right? Which means, so definitely yeah. the nine MLS votes and the three USL votes, maybe a, maybe a lot of the NWSL votes, not the NASL vote, I wouldn't think. No. But that's almost 25% of the vote mm-hmm. already in your pocket. Yep. You know what I mean? So she's only got to pick up a little bit here and there to sort of get herself uh, – up to the majority. This is true. Yeah. I mean, a little bit is 25. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that. No, no. I mean, a, an overall majority, yes. But, you mm-hmm. know, a, a majority of the other candidates. That's definitely true. And I think that's why she'll probably win the first round of voting. But you do have to have the overall majority. So you've got to get to like 50 something percent to have the. So, yes. am I right? Okay, okay, yes. Okay. So people drop out mm-hmm. potentially as we go, right? Yep. So there's still a chance that when other people drop out, um, you may end up with a sort of uh, you know revolutionary candidate yep. and a status quo candidate, and then it just depends where that goes. Fifty. This is getting into a conspiracy theory later, yep. isn't it? I can that see is where I think we're going to go. Look on your beard. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> by the look on my beard. Anything else to say about Kathy Carter? Then let me check my notes. Um, I think one of the pros for me, mm-hmm. this is a weird one, is that she doesn't seem to be trying to be too popular. I kind of like the idea that she's just saying. Here's my platform. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like she didn't make a big pitch about the state associations like all the other coaches did. Yep. We've kind of covered this, but I'm, I'm having that as a pro. No, I mean, I think, I think that's a pro from the standpoint of she didn't try to be anything she's not. She didn't say, oh, and also pro rel is going to happen. Right? Yeah. Everybody like that? Like she didn't, she didn't tell people what they wanted to hear. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that that is commendable at a time when that is kind of what some of the candidates did. Can I offer another con that you pointed out afterwards? Sure. Her watch was not fitted correctly. Got to fit that watch, man. There were little moments in there where it was like, ooh, that outfit did not work the way you thought it would. That was the incorrect choice of sock. On, Excuse me? Uh, on one occasion. Yeah, Steve Gantz wore uh, oh. socks where the elastic had worn out, so one of them slipped down so you could see his whole shin, which was also sweating. That didn't work very oh, well. Oh, dear. Yes. I didn't notice that. You <laughs> are, did. You're very observant with the fashion stuff. I try. Yeah. I try. Certainly are. For being wildly unfashionable, I try. <laughs> Before we move on to our mm-hmm. next candidate, who's uh, Michael Winograd, mm-hmm. today's show is sponsored by Squarespace. That is correct. Squarespace, um, that's where our website is hosted. Uh-huh. It's where Carl Martinez's website it is hosted, is. but we don't want to necessarily hold that as the only website that they host because there are many, many people out there with great-looking websites hosted by Squarespace. That is very true, but I would say that if the candidates did want to, uh, say, turn their cool new ideas into a website, that would be very <laughs> good. Uh, Squarespace could definitely help them do that. I would really like to have more specific platforms mm-hmm. that we could then evaluate objectively. So you, you have to win voting blocks when you do uh, yeah. US soccer presidential election with Squarespace you can just pull blocks in as many as you want to create your website they make yeah. it very easy to pull blocks in and build a base I mean look, I mean, if you go to their copy for okay. a second I'm going with a metaphor you can, you can talk about creating a beautiful website you turn your cool idea into a new website yeah if you're running for candidacy I think that's one showcase your work I mean that's obviously what you're trying to do you're trying to get your, your plan out there Publish content, same thing. We should have sell pitched- products and services. You're trying to sell yourself there if you're we the sh- candidate. We should have pitched every candidate on getting a Squarespace website. And maybe we could have shown them the Total Soccer Show website and said, hey, it, it could look like this. Because I, I am very proud of the TSS website. I'm the, not ashamed to say that. There, in the one-on-one forums, there were opportunities for questions at the end. It would have been great if it was just in every single forum, us raising our hand and asking, have you considered using Squarespace to build your platform? 
Excuse me, Sina um, yeah. Did you know you could get 10% off your first website purchase <laughs> if you use the promo code TSS at squarespace.com? And he would have said, that can't be. That's too good of a deal. <laughs> he would have said, security. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you. <laughs> get that man. Uh, but we should say, if you would like to um, set up your own website, you mm-hmm. go to squarespace.com and you get, this is important, you get a free trial, right? Yep. So you can essentially start creating your website and see if it's a good fit for you. And only when you're ready to launch do you have to sort of, you know, pony up the money. Uh, that's when you enter the promo code TSS when you actually launch it and you get 10% off your first purchase of a website. Mm -hmm. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring today's show. Indeed. Thank you Squarespace. Moving on to our next candidate, Daryl Grove. Up next is the man who I think I paid the least attention to but I was actually quite impressed with Michael Winograd. Mm-hmm. So Michael Winograd's background... Or Winograd, um, I'm still not sure. I've heard both. I'm yep. going to go Winograd. I think Sorry. we need an E after the end to make it wine. Okay. Yes? I don't know. Okay. Who well, knows? We can, I, we can do both. It's how fine. about I say Winograd, you say Winograd, and we'll have it covered between us. Potato, potato. Potato, potato. That's not how you say that. Um, so my, Michael Winograd has kind of... He does have a good resume, right? He was mm-hmm. a college player. He played pro, not in the US, but he played pro in, in Israel. Mm-hmm. Um, he has launched an amateur team, and then he's been a lawyer for a big investment firm. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of his... Uh, that's his candidacy in a nutshell. Yep. He had some big ideas, but I want to sort of play an audio clip from Michael Winograd right now. So, so the, the player pathway in the, United, in, in the US, when you talk about the development academies... You're talking about a very small sliver of all the kids playing. You're talking about that elite path uh, for kids aspiring to get onto the national team or play professionally. And so what I've proposed is state soccer centers for that elite path in each state. And that means you put in a state soccer center, you build a building with one or two fields, and it houses a full-time state soccer director. That state soccer director is in charge, and by the way, it's going to be a competitive salary. We need to get competent, uh, qualified people, make that person, make it a viable alternative to coaching in college or even coaching in MLS uh, or other pro leagues. Once we get that established, that state soccer director is going to be responsible for identifying and training that elite player. That doesn't mean we can't have ODP and all the other elements that are out there, but we're going to do it in a structured way so that there is a, a organized, structured, clear path for those players. I would love to have the state associations move into that building as, as state representatives, but that's, some states would love it, some states, you know, that's a matter of logistics. But in any event, once that clear path is defined, we're going to be moving in the same direction. So that was Michael Winograd. It's worth adding mm-hmm. that um, the, the sort of private equity firms that he has been the lawyer for, he essentially made the argument that that's where he would draw the money from, as in he would get those people who he says, you know, I've been in a room with these people, I know how they think, I'm the guy who can persuade them that they should invest the private equity into these state centers. Yep. So it's similar to Steve Gant's idea, right, to have you know a state-centric uh, version of finding the best talent in a state. Mm-hmm. But this is almost the Steve Gant's idea with, if, if Michael Winograd is correct, with much, much money behind it to build giant structures in states to make this happen. Now, yes. I, I find that quite um, a bold and visionary idea. Yes. As in he's envisioning a giant state center. I mean, I, mean, I think that's true, except, that we've, again, we've had people say that already exists at, in different states and different well, locations. That, so to go to this, back to mm-hmm. the Steve Gans one, he essentially said, I know something like this exists, but I would empower them mm-hmm. so they're actually listened to and they are right. powerful members. And yeah. I think Winograd's point with that, more so than like establishing state centers, was that it will be a very, like not lucrative, but it will be a very uh, attractive position from mm-hmm. a salary standpoint to yep. be that director. So then you're getting the best coaches applying for that job. You're getting more attention on those facilities and it creates better players overall is at least the theory and if i remember i may have this i may be remembering this incorrectly Mm -hmm. but i kind of remembered his idea his pitch to these uh, you know equity firms Mm -hmm. would be you invest money and you'll get money back because it would sort of be producing so many players that you uh, would sort of have an ownership stake, I mm-hmm. believe. Not in the, not like a third-party ownership thing, but if you invest in the clubs yep. and in the state centers, then when they go professional, you will be able to draw some money back and a return on your investment. So yeah. it's a, I'm not sure how realistic it is. Mm-hmm. And just the idea of someone saying, I know people with money, they'll give it to me, is not necessarily straightforward. But it is a bold vision that I'm, I was very much intrigued by. And it took it got my attention in a way that I didn't expect Michael Winograd to get. Agreed. I, I still am wary of anybody saying, 
oh, I'll be able to do it. Don't worry. Yes. Um, because as we heard Senior Galati talk about in, in the day previous, that that $150 million surplus, according to him, has come about through years and years of saving. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people argue that maybe that a lot of it came from Copa America Centenario. But either way, chunked it, I know that. either way, his point was it is a limited amount. And we'll get more into the specifics of that amount when we get to Carlos Cordero. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was just a little bit wary of that point of like, but I'll be able to get more money from other people. I, I get where he's coming from. And I do like that idea overall. But it is always whenever there's that conditional on the end of a plan. Yeah. It makes me wonder if there's really that much of a plan. So that was kind of my pro con on That's that. That's not true. It makes me wonder how strong of a plan it is. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like how firm is the promise he yeah. has from mm-hmm. these people that he's been in a room with? Or is it just an idea that he'll be able to yeah. do it? That was my pro con because that's the thing that stuck out to me. Do you uh-huh. have anything else pro yeah. or con? Oh, yeah, a couple things. Um, I would say, number one, with those state soccer centers, I really like the idea of empowering them more, having those regional or like those state local places where people can go. Mm-hmm. The issue, though, is like Rhode Island, that might work really well. California, if you're going to put it in Los Angeles, which is probably where they'll end up putting it, it's a big drive for a lot of people. And mm-hmm. it still does sort of eliminate people who can't afford to drive all the way to Los Angeles to try to compete in a tournament at this center to maybe get a spot. So I'm assuming maybe that maybe there'll be multiple state centers, like, you know, Northern California, Southern California. Yeah, and now you're... That would make sense. Which is still, I mean, again, that's a lot of landmass you're covering. But yeah, True. Um, and I'm sure there are other wrinkles in there about like you have, yeah, smaller ones that feed up to the top one. Yeah. I think, but overall, I like the approach that a, a couple different candidates espoused of it needs to be the states in control of how they want to develop yes. their own it was, people. It was kind of a theme running through yes. most of the candidates, right? Yeah. yeah. And and it, they almost then the states become, I would say with this investment from mm-hmm. Winograd, if it's, you know, if, it, if it's real, um, the states become more like nation states, mm-hmm. right? Almost like in the very founding of the United States when people mm-hmm. were Virginian instead of American. Yeah. That kind of thing. Um, I could really see that um, being beneficial to finding talent uh, within a state. I think so. And I don't want to go into specifics here, but I do want to say I think the most shocked I've seen Daryl Grove look in a very long time. We saw one session in the in the uh, the week. And we were wondering how old the players were. And it turned out that they were a very senior development academy team Mm -hmm. that really struggled with some basic coaching Mm -hmm. commands. I'm still not 100% that I was told the truth when I was when I asked Mm -hmm. because I was I'm kind of worried if that is the truth. Yeah, but but I think we won't name and shame. No, we won't. But I think for me, that was up until like if I hadn't seen that, I might have been more like, is the development academy really that bad of a thing? But it does feel like it's maybe not functioning in the way it was intended or at least isn't helping the best players find their way through. It certainly so, could be better, but again, yeah. Tyler Adams, Andrew Carlton, Chris Goslin, these guys have come through. So I do want to say, though, with with the way things stand, is that it feels like, from most people we spoke to, there are four main candidates. Yes. Martino, Winalda, Cordero, Kathy Carter. Yep. Uh, Winograd, Winograd, was the one that I sort of was looking around like, are we, are we sure he's not a candidate? Because... I thought he was the most polished. I thought he was the most professional. He is also a lawyer. That came through for me as well, that he was very adept at thinking on his feet. I think he got the easiest question. With or like, did he make it look like it was the easiest question? I mean, it was like, do you think... It was the equivalent of, like, is being nice important? It was like, would you incorporate the views of others, and if you don't win, will you participate yes. in the presidency of the other candidate? So actually, that is, a, that is uh-huh. a good question to get for him, but it did raise an interesting point that I like to think about is, mm-hmm. um, say Michael Winograd doesn't win. Yeah. Whoever does win should maybe go to him and say, hey, there's private equity people. If we get you involved yep. in US soccer, can you bring them on board and get some of that investment? Because yes. one of my – maybe this is a bigger topic thing for the end of the show, but one of my ideas is that the, the, each candidate has a slightly different pitch. But there's no reason that you can't take their best ideas at the end. And this ultimately becomes a great thing for US soccer because so many ideas have been generated and some of them can be implemented even if those people don't win. Yes. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's like a team of rivals, Lincoln type situation. Yeah. But I think if we were building – a, a team into one. If we're building a Voltron here, I think Michael Winograd is probably the one that we want speaking. I, it, 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 he felt to me like the one who is most capable of conveying his ideas in a clear and concise way to yeah. a group of people that needed to be able to understand them. And again, did that on the fly when he got his two questions. And that was his pitch, right? That mm-hmm. I can do that in a room. And then he did that in a room. Yes. But, you know, there was sort of a substance behind his claim. The only other thing that really kind of made me tilt my head was where he talked about how many municipalities have local funding for development of inf- infrastructure and it's not being utilized. And he had this idea of approaching local municipalities and saying we like you know we're going to build soccer fields or we're going to build like soccer infrastructure and that felt to me living in Richmond Virginia where the city is not 
that well a huff mm-hmm. to be like, hey, build there's, some a, there's more. a heating crisis in yeah. public housing right now. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And the idea of going to Richmond City and just like, like sort of like, oh, you just haven't ex- like gone after those funds. It sort of felt to me like maybe a person who wasn't as in touch with all of the different state federations and the situations within each of the states yeah. as maybe some of the other candidates. And he's maybe only seen rich America? I don't mm. I mean, I don't know his background. I don't know what... No, I mean, that, that's what in. made me tilt my head. I'll be honest. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I don't know his background either. But for a person who was talking all about his business contacts and his business connections, mm-hmm. that felt a little tone deaf. But he could be a working class guy made good. We don't know. You never know. We should, we you should never look, look know. into that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next candidate, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, um, uh, <laughs> that's, what? that's a uh, good question. Six was Eric Winolda. Yeah. Um, Eric Winolda up six. should say we also, we saw Eric Winolda in a mm-hmm. one-on-one the day before with Alexi Lalas interviewing him. Um, it was a crowded room for that. I'm going to guess that was the best attended one-on-one yeah. then coming into the, uh, mm-hmm. the presidential forum. Um, thing I would say about Eric Winolda, we know his platform, right? It's very much about how um, US soccer is not in compliance with FIFA. Mm-hmm. Uh, ProRail will kind of open the gates for investment and for all the all the great stuff in American soccer. Schedule should be changed to match the European schedule. That's, you know, an elitist system yep. will never create elite players. Mm-hmm. So this Eric Winolda, he has sort of got his message. Um, he's got a lot of the good sound bites. He's got the message down and he is out there carrying it out. Yep. This presentation, he made it sound at the start as if he was going to sort of go next level and bring something yeah. much bigger. You and I were both looking at each other like, oh my, oh my God, here we go, coming. here and we go. The reason we were doing that is because this is what he said. There are solutions and there is a reason why we are where we are. When I joined this uh, race, I wanted to fix things. I wanted to make it better because I care, because I've been there. I've been in your shoes. I've represented this country at the highest level, and I'm very privileged and honored to be able to have done that. But I think right now, the gloves have to come off. I'm not going to apologize for it. When I entered this thing, I told myself, just like every candidate, I'm going to stick a big platform on you, and and that's going to be the answer. This is going to solve your problems. A bunch of paperwork about governance, a bunch of solutions that aren't solutions where they're just ideas but there is a reason why we are where we are and i didn't punch myself out in the first two rounds and i didn't give you all the information simply because i didn't think that would be fair i didn't think that that would be a fair representation of what i needed to know if i'm going to be president i gotta know more than i did then but i know enough now Today is about solutions and the truth. And I think you deserve to hear the truth of why we are where we are. The good news in all of that is that when we have a federation that understands its role and understands what it should be doing and understands its role in the global game, not just our little insulated bubble that we've created, that we can achieve great things. Because we are so much better than what we are right now. And in this room specifically, it's not your fault. It's our fault. That's what accountability sounds like. Not pointing the finger and deeming you as noise at this point. Because you're not noise. But you do have questions that need to be answered. What we're about about to talk about will be probably the first time that I really let you on the inside. And we'll talk about some truths, but we're going to talk about solutions, okay? So we were primed, as I'm sure you are Mm -hmm. now listening to this. We were primed for some massive bombshell, some huge secret from within the halls of U.S. soccer that no one has ever heard before that would almost like change the face of this election and that's not what we got no. at all. There was no bombshell at all. There was essentially just Eric Winolda restating the problems that he sta- stated throughout his campaign. Yes. Yeah? And I think doing so in a way that was almost like knowing that knowing the questions were going to be, it felt like his answers were all kind of linked together. And that's mm-hmm. how he, he like transitioned really quickly away from something into what he actually wanted to talk about. Yes. It felt like a consistent narrative designed to make people angry. Okay, so should we sort of sum up some of the narrative? Sure. Um, One of the big things that I think he thought was the bombshell, but isn't the bombshell Mm -hmm. that that he thought it was, is essentially that U.S. soccer 
has played favourites with Major League Soccer, which in this youth council setting is he's they've played favourites with the development academies, um, and he wouldn't do that anymore. He would sort of spread the attention around to mm-hmm. state associations as well. Which, if you think about it, isn't that different to what a lot of other candidates have said? They just said it with less. Um, less aggression and less sort of a revolutionary fervor. And I think he knew that. And and I think what that speaks to, number one, is that I think he sees his main competition as Carlos Cordero and Kathy Carter, to Mm -hmm. a lesser extent, Kyle Martino, I think. But maybe those three. And so when you... Think about it. I think when Alda doesn't have as like certainly doesn't have as fully formed plan to say Cal Martino, who mm-hmm. had a laminated uh, like bound yep. plan going forward. <laughs> I think what you have to do then is seek ways to differentiate yourself with Kathy Carter. With, with Kathy Carter and Carlos Cordero, it's easy to do that by taking that. I'm going to say very gloom and doom approach of they haven't listened to you, they have misrepresented you, they don't care about you, mm-hmm. they've looked after you, the 1% have ruled everything, and that stops now. That phrasing was very obviously yeah. deliberate, right? The 99%, mm-hmm. 1%, that has a very sort of uh, political ring to it that yeah. people have, have heard before. We know what he's getting at with that. Yeah, and and I think a pro there is that he's a very good orator. He knows he how to insert those pauses, how to raise that drama, how to get people listening. You heard it, right? Yeah. You heard it. Yeah, I mean, I mean and, and it was a little bit, he had the kind of call and response at times. Mm-hmm. Uh, not call and response, but like in his 1v1 with Alexi Lalas, he was definitely encouraging people to applaud, even doing so at times when like he didn't really want to answer a question yeah, yeah. and somebody would like say a clap one time. He'd be like, oh, that one person clapped. Everybody has to clap uh, now and make a he, joke of it. Didn't he also do a thing where he was like, where would you like Christian Pulisic to move to and did like Liverpool, Man United, and essentially yeah. doing that thing of just getting Liverpool fans to cheer and Man United fans to cheer. Essentially a bit of rabble rousing. And then Alexi Lawless was like, where do you think you should go? And he wasn't ready for it. I think Ronaldo genuinely wasn't ready to have that flipped on it. Uh, and, and I think he did the same in this candidate forum that he was looking for a little bit of response. Yep. He was looking for head nods. Yep. He was looking for, are you, I mean, he are begins you frustrated? To, you don't hear it there. He begins to be like, are you tired? Are you frustrated? Are you angry? Mm-hmm. I am. And, he was, and I think he says, like, it's okay to nod. It's okay to say yes. He wanted the crowd to be angry because I think that was his way. It was, a, it was his approach to make himself stand out was by really pushing home this idea that everything is bad, mm-hmm. but I'm going to fix it. So my argument is also that even though he doesn't specifically talk about pro rail, yep. um, the, the sort of anti-MLS message and MLS are keeping everything else hostage and mm-hmm. US soccer is favor- favoring MLS was essentially the, uh, the pro rail message sort of transmuted, if that's yep. the right word, into a youth soccer forum setting. Mm-hmm. that sound about right? And again, I think he talked about it in the 1v1 setting that he has learned how to be more of a candidate. He talked mm-hmm. there about like you don't charge your – your phone while sitting on the floor of the airport. And I think it's him saying he's learned some lessons. And I think his performance in the forum showed that where I'm guessing he got the advice of, look, you can't go out there and hammer on pro rel unless you're prepared, prepared to present a plan. Cause that's mm-hmm. what people are going to want, but you can allude to it and you can kind of talk about the problems that exist because of a lack of pro rel, but not say, but I've got a plan to fix it. You can instead say, but I'm going to fix Everything isn't that a con that there's no specifically laid out solution? It felt it's more like um, very aggressive stating of the problems, mm-hmm. which I think he did very effectively. But to me, it's a con that there wasn't sort of here's my plan to fix it. I mean, it depends. On, I think if you're looking for it, to, if you're looking for him to have a solution, then yes. But I'm not entirely certain that that was his goal. I think he was approaching those 200 or 600 or however many candidates were in there. Excuse me, voters so were in there. And was trying to get them to see, yeah, you're right, this is bad, I believe in him. He was trying to get, I think, them to believe in the charisma, mm-hmm. or the charismatic like, emphasis of his message. One thing that didn't quite ring uh, true to me is the second question mm-hmm. was always about how do you get the various youth soccer organizations to align mm-hmm. together instead of them all sort of fighting for various pieces of the pie, right? Mm-hmm. And his answer was... Well, align is a good word because it's a lot like comply. Mm -hmm. And then he went into his whole thing about how U.S. soccer is not FIFA compliant with solidarity payments Mm -hmm. uh, to clubs, which obviously a lot of youth clubs want solidarity payments because they get money for their players that they move on. And you know, we I think he talked about the FIFA schedule and all that kind of stuff. And but I really felt that was slightly dodging the question of how would you get the question was how do you get those youth soccer organizations to all sort of harmonize and be on the same page. But it instead, wasn't sort of dodging the question. It was 100% yeah. dodging the question. But that's so That I'm, word sounds a bit like that word, so let's talk about this instead. But that's what I'm saying is I think this wasn't just here my opening remarks. It was knowing that he had he knew the questions. He knew he could prepare his answers to those questions. I think his answers to those questions were part of his opening remarks. Yes. And so I'm going to guess written in there was comply or like comply is a good or align is a good word because of comply. I'm mm-hmm. guessing that was written. I'm guessing that wasn't yes, 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 of his head. Yeah. And it allowed him to very quickly get back to the thing 
he actually wanted to be talking about, the thing that he knew would resonate more when he said it. Any more pros or cons from over there, Tanner? Uh, I mean, I mean, cons, I think we've already been sort of negative on him, but I just, I didn't love his presentation, his speech in the candidate forum because it didn't offer anything new in my mind. Mm-hmm. It was a lot of what we've already heard him say as, yep. as we've talked about. When he was on the show, for and example. It, and yeah. it wasn't anything specific. He didn't offer us new plans. And when you say we've had tons of ideas, now we need solutions. We, have, we know the problems, now we need the solutions. To then go out and really just dramatically hit home the problems in even more like yeah. brimstone sort of way, it's not delivering on what you promised. It felt to me like saying, here are the problems, I'll do the opposite. Yeah. You know, that was the solution was just, I'll do the opposite of what this is. Yeah, yeah. And, like, and for a candidate who began by saying like, look, pro-rel is possible because I can get the owners on board. I can get the Major League Soccer owners on board. He has had time to further expound upon that idea or kind of draw up some actual plans for how he plans to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Like a timeline of Pro-Rel. And I think I maybe expected him to do that, and I'm still expecting him to do that up until the election. And that's something I really hope because he is a strong candidate. I think he 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 has the, the attention. He is one of the favorites. He has the attention. I think he's probably the most dramatic, charismatic speaker of anybody running for the presidency. And he has the massive backing of of the populace, I would say, of the people mm-hmm. who are interested. I think if you did a Twitter poll, it's gonna be Eric Winalda every single time. But uh, what, but I don't know if, but I don't know if that's representative of voters and it makes me a little bit nervous. What did you make of the sort of the mood in the room and mm-hmm. not the forum, which was a bit more civil, right? Mm-hmm. But not that the one on one wasn't civil, but there was definitely a bit more of a sort of rabble type element. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Rabble's a bad word as well. I didn't mean to insult anyone in the room, but there's definitely a sort of revolutionary element in the room. I noticed people literally calling Eric one older Mr. President mm-hmm. in his one-on-one. And that had me... Why is that revolutionary? Because it just, it's almost like, this is our candidate. We're going to take it mm-hmm. over. You know what I mean? As opposed to, there's a democratic process we're going to participate in. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Well, I think, I think that is also probably part of the problem with these elections is that it's so difficult to understand who's voting and how regular people can have a say in things when yeah. the reality is they kind of can't. Um, but I think if you looked in that room when he did the one-on-one, probably 95% or 90% of the people in there by the end, we're like, yeah, this is the guy. Yep. He's smart. He's funny. He knows what he's doing. He can handle Lawless. I want him to be president. <laughs> and my only concern is that when he takes that really dramatic approach that he took, if he doesn't win, I think people see it as, see, it's a conspiracy. It's U.S. soccer aligning. If Carlos Cordero wins, see, yeah. the establishment's never going to let an outsider win. I'm done with soccer. And that so, makes me a little bit nervous. So there could be a genuinely almost equally revolutionary candidate, Mm -hmm. but there'll be a reaction against them because they're not Eric Winalda. And I think that's a a real problem that we could run into if Winalda doesn't win, but someone who does, like, plan to implement change does win, Mm -hmm. but then they don't sort of get the backing of the people who wanted Winalda or nothing. Yeah. 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 And and I think that his goal right now is to eliminate the quote-unquote establishment candidates, and then I think he'll turn his attention to Kyle Martino. Uh, And it's been interesting to see. Positively or negatively, we'll see. I don't know, because, I mean, when he was on the show, he was pretty negative, and... And then he, made, then he made some positive comments, but then he alluded to those same negative comments in the one-on-one session. So I think he hasn't made up his mind entirely, but I would rather see him focus on some specific issues and some specific plans. Uh, we have two more candidates we to sure talk do. about. Um, we sure do. Up next is Paul Caligiuri. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize when Paul Caligiuri came on stage, it would be a reunion between Caligiuri yeah. and JP Della Camera to sort of uh, pat each other on the back. I don't mean that yep. sarcastically, about the shot heard around the world. Indeed. I mean, Galagiri, the man who really started this era of American soccer, mm-hmm. that goal that qualified us for the World Cup in 1990. Indeed. Yeah. So before we play the clip, yeah. uh, Taylor, what was your take on Paul Caligiri? Well, he was one of the only other candidates that we saw in the 1v1 session. He yes. chose not to have a moderator. It was just him talking to the audience. We mm-hmm. were only there for about like 10 minutes. That particular um, presentation had a very Tom Cruise in Magnolia feel. How do you mean? I mean, that's what I texted you. He was kind of pacing around mm-hmm. like very intensely there was an intensity there was and a sort of looking people in the eyes in the room and r- very much focusing mm-hmm. on people and and i think asking questions as well a lot of questions and i think that compared to his like presidential forum appearance the presidential forum appearance was night and day for mm-hmm. me because we saw two speeds from yeah well, the, well just that one we saw i think he hadn't really thought it through his 1v1 session because number one it was just one not 1v1 mm-hmm. but number two it ended up being him trying to get of audi- a lot of audience participation and in a big room like that people don't really want to participate and so being like who here's a coach from california who's done this yeah anybody 
Uh, what about you, sir? And, and like trying to kind of force jokes in there, and it just felt like maybe he hadn't thought it through all the way. What got me um, only caught the, the like the tail end of this, but mm-hmm. um, he asked one coach who was from I believe Southern California, like mm-hmm. your U seventeen team. Do you think they could, you know, over the course of I think ten games, mm-hmm. do you think they could beat the U seventeen national team? Mm-hmm. And that coach said yes. And Kalajiri was very much like, yeah, I know. So it seemed to be like they're tapping into that like mm-hmm. anti development academy to youth national team pipeline yeah. by saying. There are teams of players just as good who are not in that pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, and so that but it's still sort of rang because it was like, there you go. He could. Yeah. Anyway, what I wanted to talk and, <laughs> You and really I, needed to bring twenty two players out and prove that. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so then to see him on stage in the candidate forum, I thought he did a much better job. I thought oh, yeah. he was I thought he was more polished than I expected him to be. I thought he spoke clearly, concisely. He wasn't very emotional. He was talking about the facts and the reality of the situation. Mm-hmm. I thought he was more charming than I expected him to be. Sharply so that, dressed. Yeah, sharply dressed. So that was a little more of like the general approach I thought he had or in terms of his general impact. But we can hear more about what he actually had to say now. Here we go. But most importantly that I, I look at in all those lenses is in the multicultural sector an area that we've been talking about for decades. Decades, and it hasn't fallen on based on effort. The passion, the effort has been there. There's been a lot of great work, but we truly need a visionary that now could propel us to a different level. My plan has, one of the plans I'd like to see is that we tap into the multicultural sector with a simple process. It's to make all high school varsity coaches, Olympic developmental program scouts, ODP scouts, They are our access into the communities that they serve. Being a high school coach, you don't make a lot of money. You serve your community, and they definitely know and they have access to unregistered players and talent that we're missing. It's a simple solution, but under an Olympic developmental program process, we could get into those communities. So I think... Then I went and read more about Paul Caligiuri after hearing him speak. And to learn, I didn't realize that he was the only uh, one of only two candidates here to have already been on U.S. soccer's board. Mm-hmm. He played futsal for the U.S. futsal team, and that was a big question about other national teams that aren't just the men's and women's national teams. Yeah. I think, um, wasn't that just because he was kind of available and they needed a player and he was nearby? That's also possible. So, yeah, there's some serendipity to that mm-hmm. story. Yeah. But as far as I know, he was the first candidate to really strongly – go back on the idea of ODP, the Olympic yes. Development Program, and the good that it serves. So can we maybe, because this was a big uh, mm-hmm. point for almost every candidate and definitely with a lot of coaches. Um, can you maybe explain the ODP program and why people would want it to come back? I mean, I can. I still don't fully know why it's called the Olympic Development Program. I'm assuming it was the idea of developing players to win the Olympics. Yeah. But essentially what it is, is it starts out at, uh, I think it goes something state i think it's like local or region you know because state region national there and then there's one before st- district there it is yeah. finally remembered it so district you try out at your like local level so it would be all the players in say richmond can come out try out and the best however many make that team then the best players from that go to the next pool and the next pool and so on so it gives you sort of more like local to regional to national uh development plans and it's very tryout based which yep. means it's not a scout being like well i'm gonna only look at these development academy Academy players and I'm going to pick, take my pick from there. Mm-hmm. It's like if you're just some kid, you can go try out and you can impress. You could make the district. Then you can make the state yeah. and so on, right? Theoretically. I mean, theoretically, it's, it, yeah, it but is, at least theoretically. As it was when I played, it was very – at least when I was playing is what I'm trying to say. Sorry. It was very political. And so mm-hmm. if, if your district coach happened to be the coach of here in Richmond, say the Richmond Strikers, he's probably going to know his players or yeah. have that affiliation with that one club. We had a very sim- – we don't have an Olympic development program. Mm-hmm. We have a very similar thing in England, yes. right? The, the district uh, would have a coach and he would watch the high school games. Yep. But also that district coach would also be a high school coach. Mm-hmm. So his players would often make the team. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and so I Hello, think, Mr. Boardman. And I think that's where Caligiuri's idea of having it expand to after school programs, to having it be part of like high school, not necessarily curricula, but it, it is you can go there and play ODP after high school. Mm-hmm. That gives you a ready-made opportunity to participate. Yep. The issue I had then was that idea that high school coaches become scouts. I thought that was a great idea. It's very innovative, right? It is. They're already, and like like uh, Caligari said in the clip, he's, they're already coaching everyone who's yeah. around, you assume goes to high school, yeah. right? Unless mm-hmm. you're totally off the grid. Um, and then, therefore, the high school coach is seeing 
players play from all communities, which was mm-hmm. yeah, his big selling point on that. Um, so it definitely makes a lot of sense if you're coaching high school to then also be an ODP scout. Mm-hmm. So then you can propel the best players upwards and therefore at the very top at the ODP level, the state gets the very best players. I would say theoretically. Yes. Yeah. Because then I, I, tweeted, I, saw, I saw a Twitter feed. I tweeted that out and many, many high school teachers pointed out that number one, a lot of high schools it's whoever can coach can coach. I know uh, Thomas Jefferson here in Richmond, the the girls team at least, it used to be whoever was around. Even when I was in high school, TJ was like, oh, you football coach want to coach soccer? Great, mm-hmm. we need somebody. That's what you had for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, I did. So that doesn't mean you're getting the best coaching. Uh, it also means that if you are a teacher who's coaching, then that's a whole other level of responsibility that you now have to deal with. And so we saw a bunch of people joking, like, is he going to do my lesson plans for me? Is he going to hire a teaching assistant <laughs> to, to make this possible? Time. Yeah. And I do think that and maybe if you asked him that in a 1v1 setting, it would talk more about how you use some of the $150 million to subsidize programs, to help coaches, to help coaches get training, to make ODP coaches and scouts that much more uh, easy of a position. But we're talking about gigantic numbers of high school varsity you coaches. Sure you said varsity, right? Yep. Gigantic numbers of high school varsity coaches, right? Every high school, presumably, has mm-hmm. a varsity soccer coach. Yep. So if you, if you were to pay that varsity coach yeah. a little extra... Suddenly, that, that number, if, even if it's a low number, if it's $100, like a stipend, that number yeah. multiplies very quickly when you're doing every high school in the country. Yes. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and so I think while there are obvious problems with that, it was a little bit for me at least like, okay, but he's thinking about different ideas. Mm-hmm. He's thinking about different approaches as opposed to the development academy isn't working. It's not helping develop players. You know it. I know it. It's not your fault. It's the Federation's fault. We're going to fix that. Yeah. There we go. So it's an That's idea, a platform. but it's a flawed idea. That's, That's the, the trouble problem. with ideas That's is you can pick them the apart, right? That's the pro and the con. It absolutely mm-hmm. is. Um, anything else on Paul Caligiuri? Yeah, I, I guess I want to rephrase one thing I said. I said he was a polished speaker. You listen to that audio – Polished is maybe the wrong word. I had he's an earnest speaker, and that's okay. what I felt like is that you were kind of getting the no BS assessment that he as he saw it. He mm-hmm. he was telling you how he saw U.S. soccer, and again, I appreciated that without any hyperbolic rhetoric. Fair enough. Um, should we move on to the final candidate sure. and very much the most senior candidate, yep. both in years and in current position, mm-hmm. Carlos Cordero, yep. um, who is the current U.S. soccer vice president? But mm-hmm. worth noting. He's not Sino Galati's guy. It seems to me Cordero announced his candidacy before Galati had withdrawn from the race. And one of the, one of the things he's been saying is we can't have more of the same. Yes. Yeah? And if I were to read between the lines there, my guess is that that was like maybe he knew Sino Galati was looking elsewhere mm-hmm. and possibly directly at Kathy Carter. <laughs> and Carlos Cordero, if he's been there for a while, felt like maybe it was his time, assumed that when Galati stepped down, he would be the next one. Maybe he just felt like, all right, well, then I'm doing this because if you're not looking at me, then I'll look at myself. So would you like to hear some audio from Carlos Cordero? Sure. I'll sit right there. So, JP, growing youth soccer – promoting a more unified landscape, making things more affordable. Th- these need to be our highest priorities. And, and if you look at my platform, and that's what I talk about. I'd make youth soccer the single biggest priority for myself uh, over the next four years. Now, look, in an, I- in an ideal world, we'd have a single unified platform, much like other countries do. The reality is that's not going to happen. So we have to accept the fact that we'll always have multiple youth programs. But there needs to be a level playing field. I've talked about this already. There needs to be a level playing field where basically the rules are enforced. And I think competition can be good when it's fair. But let's think beyond that. I think instead of fighting with each other, we should be thinking about the millions of kids who are playing soccer in unaffiliated programs outside of U.S. soccer. These are largely from underserved communities, the immigrant populations that we have. Those are the kids that we should be targeting. So my, my priority will be to grow the programs rather than worry about as much. Or we shouldn't be worried as much about you know, the kids we have. We should be looking at a, at, a, at a membership of closer to 7 or 8 million kids, not the 3.5 or 4 that we've had for the last 10 years. So I propose in this fund that we would dedicate 100% of your membership fees to growing programs in your local communities. Now, I recognize that's a relatively small amount of money, but this will be an annual fund, so three plus four plus three. These, these numbers add up over time. But this is just the beginning. And I, I like to see us working together on a grander plan to bring in more resources. So I think it's worth sort of clarifying exactly what Carlos Cordero was talking about there. As I understood it, it was he was saying to the 
the youth state associations, the, the membership fees that you normally pay up to us to, at mm. US Soccer. Yep. You know, it's almost like you know paying tribute <laughs> in a feudal society. Um, instead, we'll take that money. Maybe it might go through US Soccer, but essentially we'll take that money that each state association pays, and we'll then invest it back into local programs at the state level. I believe he used the the number 100%, mm-hmm. right? So it means all state association fees collected are kept by state associations and invested in programs, grow those programs, and essentially you just better serve by having uh, double the number of kids is essentially yep. what he said, right? Mm-hmm. Serve more members of the community. Right. And with that in mind, my biggest pro for him is that he is the closest candidate to Sunil Gulati. Whoa. That is also my biggest con for him. <laughs> um, Whoa, again. So... What I found really interesting in Sunil Gulati's 1v1 uh, session with Alexi Lalas was that, I mean, he knows his stuff. He's been yep. there forever. That's no surprise. But he was able to back up a lot of what he said when he was talking about promotion relegation. He was talking about how we can't – like, he kind of made that straw man argument, but he still had reasons for why it can't work yeah, right away. I still wasn't thrilled with how strawy a straw man was. I agree. But what I took away from him was that he is able to explain where he's coming from at least and give some – clear information behind it. Now, I think he distorts some information. I think definitely he kept doing that like day after tomorrow and we can't mm-hmm. do that tomorrow. Like no one is saying we need to do it tomorrow. Yep. But he has ideas about where US so soccer now, is mm-hmm. and I think Carlos Cordero does and I think those ideas are really important because Carlos Cordero is the only candidate that I heard who actually understands US soccer's financials. <laughs> that's because he's there but that's incredibly important because one of the things, we didn't hear it there, but one of the things he talked about was that US soccer is not as rich as we think we are. Yes. He makes the claim that that 150 million uh, that we have at surplus will be depleted to 50 million just funding our existing programs. So all the candidates out there who are saying, "I'm going to use that 150 million to do that," I'm going to use it to do that. If this is true, if what he's saying is true, then when they get elected, they'll have a hundred million dollars less than they thought. Yep. That's going to impact what they're actually able to do. Mm-hmm. So he also makes the point: USS of USSF whew, is spending only fifty million dollars on player development. England spends five hundred million. Yep. So again, his you point have is numbers. yeah, but his point being that we're not spending enough. We need to do more, and yep. that's what I appreciated. It's sort of I felt like his pro was that he is coming from that Gulati model of understanding the basics of it. But, and how but we... with an appetite for change that exactly. Gulati doesn't have. Exactly. Right? And, and... When Gulati was even thinking about rerunning, mm-hmm. he wasn't going to run on a candidacy of, all right, things have gone bad the last few years. Yep. I am really going to make some big changes. Yeah. It was essentially just saying, eh, probably be more of the same. Yeah. Don't worry, we'll qualify for the next one. And then if you're wondering, I would say he made smart statements that differentiated Cordero? from Kathy Carter. Yes. yes. Uh, he made the comment of like, this isn't your fault. This is our fault. He said that to everybody in attendance. So that makes him stand immediately mm-hmm. at odds with Kathy Carter saying, well, we're going to establish an independent council to see who maybe is at fault or yep. whatever – I think – so this is a pro for me mm-hmm. in Carlos Cordero's platform. It's very easy to paint him as the sort of uh, status quo candidate. Mm-hmm. And you've got all those like, youth coaches who are non-DA, non-development academy, who are upset at the way things were handed down to them. He would be sort of a more apologetic, open to ideas version of U.S. soccer. He essentially said that the player development rollout, which mm-hmm. if you don't know is a thing that came down from U.S. soccer or came out of U.S. soccer house mm-hmm. – um, and we did a whole Top Draw Soccer episode about this, right? And established new rules about how you play games at youth soccer level. And it was things like the build-out line you had to start from behind there. Mm-hmm. And they weren't necessarily bad ideas, but they they didn't come from the grassroots up. They came from U.S. soccer down. And it was very sort of authoritative. And he essentially, we, we maybe should have played that clip, he essentially apologized for the way that was handled yeah. and said that is not the type of thing we'll, we will be doing again. And that's where I think he knew what he was doing. Yeah. He was saying that to that audience because he knows he has to win some votes there. And I will say he was one of the few candidates I heard who got applause at a time when it wasn't an obvious applause break. Mm-hmm. It wasn't after his opening remarks. It was during his comments about um, free ODP, how he wanted to have an established free Olympic development program, and he wanted there to be multi- multiple avenues for player development. That got a big round of applause yep. from the assembled people. And I think that was what he was going for because I think he knows he can get some votes for from the pro vote, I think he knows he can get some from the adult. If he can get some from the youth, maybe suddenly he starts to gain an yeah. advantage that he didn't otherwise seem to have. He seems like the guy that could pull a percentage of votes from each pool to add up to possibly a winning margin. I think so. Right? And I think that's why he was smart in what he did. I will say, though, that going back to my point, cons. his con is that he is 
similar to Sunil Gulati. Yeah. Both in terms of whether or not it's fair, he is seen as an establishment candidate when you've been on the board for as long as he has done yeah. what he I has. I don't know how long he's been on the board. It may not be as long as you think. It's, it's not as long as Sunil Gulati. It's Gulotti. definitely not as long as Sunil yeah. Gulati, but it's still long enough for him to be that sort of establishment candidate. Mm-hmm. But then also, you look at the fact that he was the only one who didn't do a one-on-one interview. He did not deliver opening remarks. Or, when, excuse me, when he did, he sat down. He was the only other candidate who sat to deliver his opening remarks. Mm-hmm. And we know this firsthand because we were standing right there, would not go on record at the end. Did not want to yeah, be interviewed someone, in the room. I can't remember who the journalist was. We probably shouldn't say anyway, even mm-hmm. if we did know, but I genuinely yeah. don't know. Um, was asking uh, Carlos Cordero to sort of do an interview. And yep. they, they, he kind of said like, no, I don't, I don't really want to. No, it was sort of like, I don't know what the questions are going to be. There's music in the background. They were mm-hmm. playing the final countdown by Europe when yeah. the session ended. Which is very different to some of the other candidates who are very much like out and about. In the lobby afterwards, they're kind of out and about, shaking hands, yeah. rubbing bellies, um, kind of just, you know, making sure that they were available to talk to everybody. So th- yeah. that openness isn't there with Carlos Cordero no. that it is with the candidates. Part of that, I think, is that it's because he's an older man, right? You think? Yeah, I think he's not sort of as like young and energetic as some of the guys who want to go around shaking hands. You know? Tough. I guess is what I'm saying. Right, if, you're, yeah. if you're running for office, if you're, the, if you're running for president of the United States, your argument can't be like, well, I'm older, so I'm tired, so now I'm not going <laughs> to shake hands. That wasn't hand. his argument. <laughs> no, but I, but I think that if you are trying to show that you're a different candidate than your predecessor, who is right now wildly unpopular, who like, wasn't maybe always open and always transparent in what was happening, to then be like, no, I don't want to be on record in an interview after I've just delivered That's, a yeah. bunch of remarks about my plan, uh-huh. it, it doesn't necessarily inspire a lot of confidence. That's where he could differentiate himself yep. from Galati is so. to go and be more sort of open and glad-handy. Mm-hmm. I know, know Galati can be glad-handy in a room of powerful people, yes. but not with, for example, US soccer, yep. media, podcast magazines, yeah. and so on. And and I'll say, with all that said, I said earlier, Kyle Martino was one of my two candidates that I thought did the best. Again, I'm not saying they're my favorite candidates. I'm saying the ones who I thought did the best in these remarks. Carlos Codero was the other. I would agree. I, I think maybe I didn't have high expectations, but I kind of definitely got the sense that this man knew what he was talking about. That's it right? for me. Yeah. And he was not going to be, literally, he would not be more of the same authoritative US soccer. It would be a very sort of organized functional US soccer under his mm-hmm. leadership. But as I said earlier, with an appetite for change and a less arrogant approach, more open to ideas. I'd say an appetite if, for, if not interviews. An appetite for limited change. I I mean, yeah. he's obviously not going to be a, pers- a person pushing pro rel if that's what mm-hmm. you, you really, really want. He's not your he didn't candidate. didn't address that really, did he? I haven't heard no, him but, talk about but that. But there's no chance that he is for pro rel. There's no chance he's going to like ask or try to get Major League Soccer to change their system. I think yeah. that is not a step he really thinks needs to be taken. I mm-hmm. think he's going to focus more on reforming youth development, finding ways to make U.S. soccer make more money and promote equality and diversity, as we heard him talk about. One thing I don't think he leaned on as mm-hmm. much, which I think is interesting, is that he's a Colombian originally, mm-hmm. right? Moved to the United States, U.S. citizen, obviously, now. Yep. Um, but he's the only Hispanic candidate, as I understand it, right? That checks out. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, this is Daryl cutting in with a quick self-fact check and correction. Carlos Cordero was born in India to Goan and Colombian parents. Born in India to Goan and Colombian parents. But he didn't seem to put that front and center as, hey, you want Hispanic, Hispanic outreach? How about have a, a Spanish-speaking um, U.S. soccer president? And I wonder if that's a deliberate thing to not sort of do it in a tokenism kind of way. You could see it that way, or you could see it as it's also political inexperience, maybe, that he doesn't know to promote it's that possible. idea. Yeah. Or maybe that was why you heard him say, we need more diversity outreach. Yeah. Maybe you just kind of leave it there for everybody to put two and two together. Uh-huh. All right. So interesting stuff from Carlos Cordero. Anything else on this? Yeah, I just want to say, like, I, I think for me, the reason why what he said resonated is because we had heard seven candidates before him, some of whom had like limited plans, some of whom had fuller plans, some of whom had... No plans, in my opinion. Uh, And so to hear a person really know what they were talking about, it shouldn't be surprising because he's coming from where he's coming. But it was still kind of reassuring that, like, at least this form of the establishment candidate isn't just more of the same, everything's great, does want change, but has the information to back it up. Okay. Shall we now talk about then how – how we think this is all going to work out. Yeah. yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, so as we said before, to remind people, the way the voting blocks work is there's the Athletes Council, which is about 20 athletes, right? Soccer players. Like, who's on there? Like, Stu Holden's on there. Jonathan Spector's on there, I believe. Um, Christy Rampone's on there. Lauren Holiday, uh, I believe. Yes. Okay, we, we don't list them all. But, you yeah. know, th- so it gives you an idea of who's, who's on there. Branching. I want to mention branching. Um, that's 20% of the vote because that's a federal law, mm-hmm. that 20% of any sort of uh, sport federation has to be represented by athletes, mm-hmm. right? Then uh, approximately 25% each for 
youth council, adult council, which is like the amateur stuff that we that we play in, um, and then the professional council, which yep. is the uh, the team owners, and then five percent or less, five percent or fewer, mm-hmm. um, around five percent, <laughs> maybe a little less, um, is made up of sort of miscellaneous various uh, blocks like life members, people former like presidents, yeah. all that good stuff. Yep. So, given everything we've just said about each candidate. How do we see this thing shaking out? And I guess we should just go straight to your... Is it a conspiracy theory or is it sort of a, it, it, a guesstimate of what is, what's going to happen? It is my, my completely Taylor opinionated guesstimate. So okay, I'm so not no, saying... no inside baseball knowledge? No, no? no none at all. But you, did, you weren't whispering with candidates in the corner while I was going to the restroom? I was not. And actually, in retrospect, we probably should have asked more of the actual voters who were in the room how they felt. From what I've read, uh, most of them did not say anything, did not commit one way or the other, did not imply much so you know take what you read with a grain of salt there yeah um but i think we can kind of stick with what we thought going into this that of the eight there were probably four candidates who were the most well positioned with mm-hmm. the largest backing it seemed Cassie to win Carter, the election carlos cordero mm-hmm. eric Ronaldo, carl martino and i would basically split those four into those two groups the way you listed them kathy carter and carlos cordero businessy yep and eric Ronaldo and carl martino okay and i like think former players and my guess would be that you're gonna see kathy carter win the first round of votes she'll probably have the largest majority uh i think it was but again as i learned for sure today you have to hit 50 percent eventually yes and <laughs> as uh, so it can't be a pl- plurality no i think it was andy das i saw on twitter say that was his expectation as well but it would be difficult to see kathy carter build on that i think uh-huh. carlos cordero can build on that i think his message is more popular and i think as the establishment candidate who is promoting more change and a little bit more transparency and i think even if he's not as confident of an orator i think did better overall Mm -hmm. i think he's very professorial is the word i would use i think you'll start to see him gain more and kathy carter slip a little bit and i think eventually she probably throws her votes to him that's that's what i was going to say so if kathy carter drops out then the pro sort of Mm -hmm. more businessy type vote all of that kathy carter all those kathy carter votes go to carlos cordero Plus, he's like maybe general popularity. Yeah. All of a sudden, he has a very big block. He could easily be the next U.S. soccer president. It's possible because it's not. It's worth re- reiterating that it's not as though Sunu Gulati said, "I'm supporting Kathy Carter," and then Carlos Cordero was like, "Oh yeah, well, it's despite you, I'm doing this." He threw his hat in, I think, before Kathy Carter did. So then it is sort of like there's maybe not necessarily bad blood between the two of them. Mm-hmm. So then it does make that kind of uh, combination slightly more possible to me. Okay, and then the on the other side, then the more revolutionary candidates, Eric Bernardo yep. and Kyle Martino, do seem the mm-hmm. best positioned. Um, what do we think happens with those two guys? If you asked, uh, first of all, I think there is a decent chance that Eric Winalda can just win this outright. I think yeah. he has a lot of popular support. Mm-hmm. And that the question will be how much does his popular support? If you put it at a Twitter poll right now, I think he probably wins. Wasn't that Galati's quote in the one on one? Was it? it? says it's not decided by Twitter oh, there polls. You go. Remember? Yeah. yeah. And so I think, and like if you looked at that, the people who assembled in that voting room, I think probably all of them would have mm-hmm. voted for him, but, but only lot, six of them could. A lot of attendees, mm-hmm. right? Meaning like people who are attending the conference yeah. but were not voters. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it was like a room of like 200 people, six people in there could actually vote. Yeah. So that carries some weight there. So then it comes down to like you look at that athlete council for a second. I don't think they're going to back – or the athlete block. Uh, I don't think they're going to vote for Cordero. I don't think they're going to vote for Carter. It comes down to who they support between Kyle Martino, who a lot of them was a peer, mm-hmm. uh, or er- Eric Winalda. And I feel like maybe it's Kyle Martino. He's just, I think when I look at the people on the Athlete Council, mm-hmm. they all get one vote yeah. each. But they, we presume they all talk, right? Mm-hmm. And so they may end up like coalescing around one vote. Um, they're all of a generation. Uh, they're all of basically Kyle Martino's generation more than they are Eric Winalda's mm-hmm. generation. And to me, like this is pure speculation, right? I don't know this. Yeah. But that might be the thing that swings it, that they all know and trust Kyle Martino more than they know and trust Eric Winalda, yeah. which is interesting. But again, that's 20% of the vote if they all vote that way. I mean, you look at like anybody backing Hope Solo. Mm-hmm. I don't think she has a chance to win, but I do think she has a chance to throw some votes to either Winalda or Martino. And actually, I would guess for Hope Solo mm-hmm. in the original, again, all speculation, right? We should caveat all this. Yep. But um, I can't remember how many of the Athletes Council were uh, women soccer players either a national team or you know just pro mm-hmm. um but you could see them maybe being tempted to go with hope solo right mm-hmm. and i know she's upset people on the u.s national team in the past that's no secret right so she maybe gets half of those mm-hmm. to be so suddenly it's quite diluted and it may be that then if she has to drop out then they all go to carl martino or eric Ronaldo. yes yeah. we are, are we sort of doing the athlete council a disservice by assuming they'll vote for an athlete uh it kind of makes sense right but 
I mean, I think that's the thing. Not a disservice, but I think we're going with what we think will happen. I mean, yeah. if, if you're looking at some of those athletes on there, I don't think a lot of the female voters are going to look at, say, Kathy Carter and think, mm-hmm. yep, she gets my vote. Or Carlos Cordero, yeah. based on what Hope Solo said. Yeah? Exactly. He had his chance to be a change maker and he didn't take it. And so I think what you're going to see is Carlos Cordero gain momentum. The question will be, does he gain it fast enough before Martino and Ronaldo can maybe possibly theoretically combine those votes. And that will be the question is how do they do that? It's thrilling now, right? Because it's so on the, mm-hmm. on the edge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because, and I think there's a chance that you see maybe Cal Martino elected president with Eric Ronaldo appointed as like the general manager or whatever you want to go yeah, with there. A new position that's going to be created. Yeah, that's I, possible. I could see that happening uh, because then that kind of satisfies mm-hmm. the Ronaldo backers of like, look, he still has a position in charge. He still has insight. He still is kind of overseeing major aspects of U.S. soccer. But then you have Cal Martino above him as a more sort of like – appeals to, I'd say, all of the people on that list as opposed to just a certain demographic on that list. I would love Eric Ronaldo as the liaison between the U.S. soccer sort of big brass Mm -hmm. and the U.S. men's national team because not only, you know, we've heard him tell the stories about, you know, the 95 Copa America when he had to go to battle against Mm -hmm. U.S. soccer. I really think he would fight for the players, both the men's team and the women's team and and the other teams, like you know, the the Paralympic team. Mm -hmm. Um, He would definitely go to bat for all those teams with the board, I think he would be great in that role. He would kind of annoy some people, but he would get he would definitely get concessions for the players or get better treatment yeah. for the players. I think that would be a huge role for him if he doesn't win the election going forward. I think so. Yeah. And I think so. And so I think those, in my opinion, those are going to be the three main candidates uh, somewhere along the voting process. would be okay. Cordero, Martino, Winalda. And my understanding is this will be streamed live on February 10th. I think I'll be... Uh, I was going to say I'll take the day off work, but I work with you, so we'll be here working, watching that. That'll be part of our job. Um, I wanna, We'll have to see, like, look a little bit more at how the voting process works, because if it is expected to be like done in two hours maybe that's a live show daryl maybe that's a live streaming show oh that's interesting mm-hmm. yeah so maybe maybe we can do that maybe maybe anything else to add before we wrap up this very long but i hope very informative show <laughs> hopefully um yeah i mean i'll say this that like that is my guess as to yeah. who the four leading candidates are that's what we've heard from other sources but there's also a chance that Paul Caligiuri won a lot of people over, yeah. had a lot of support support behind the scenes. We didn't know about it. It really could be any of the eight yep. candidates. Yep. <laughs> he says, pausing to think about Don't, that statement. Assumptions make bad three ways, right? This I is heard, true. I heard on an episode of Always Sunny. Um, so I'm thinking... Did you really hear yeah, that? It, it was sung, if that helps. Okay, um, okay, okay, okay. So... We can't just we can't just choose that it's definitely we can't just say that it's definitely these four because that's what that's what everybody seems to be thinking. Yeah. Therefore, the other four can't win. I think it's worth keeping an open mind to like, yeah, Winograd may have like wrapped up a bunch of votes and we don't know. It's yeah. it's a decent possibility. So we'll have to see how the voting pans out. I do have some final thoughts. Sure. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like a TV host. Final thoughts. Um, so whatever happens, I think we're going to be in a better position than we have been. I think this presidential uh, election campaign. Um, with all these different ideas coming from eight different angles, eight different people, I think has really sort of enriched the conversation and opened my eyes and possibly the you know, U.S. soccer in general's eyes to what is possible in terms of making big changes. And I've heard a lot of good ideas from each candidate. And I think if any of those get like pulled in altogether, we can end up with a lot of sort of good initiatives happening and some positive change. And I want to say the biggest thing I heard from the Youth Soccer Council Almost, I think every candidate basically promised to put more power back to the state associations and a li- not, not scrapping the Development Academy, but take, one. <laughs> taking power away from the Development Academy yeah. and giving more power back to the state associations. From what I've heard from uh, youth soccer coaches, what I've read, I, I, that will be a very, mm-hmm. very good development for the future of not just U.S. soccer – but for American soccer. And we'll end up with a situation where U.S. soccer is not so um, not so uh, patriarchal and authoritative in terms of telling everybody around the country what to do. Mm-hmm. They should be more open to receiving ideas from the states instead of coming down on them. So yeah. whichever candidate it is, I think we, could see, we'll, we'll, we will see that change and it will be a positive. So we should be excited for that development. And I would say with that in mind that there are pros and cons to literally every single candidate. Yes. There is not one candidate, in my opinion, that is like light and day the best candidate by far that mm-hmm. everybody should be really pumped for. I think there are reasons to be excited about a lot of them. I think there are reasons to not be excited about a lot of them. And so I would just encourage everybody to keep reading, keep doing your yes. own research. Don't read the headlines or just the headline. Click the article and read the whole <laughs> thing before you decide that you know things are – 
as they seem, because there has been some misre- misrepresentation of things. I think that happened with Thomas Rungan. Well, and it, well, Eric Winald on the New York Times comes to mind that it's, that I think they reported that he was broke, which I do not believe is no. true, and I think he has refuted vehemently. That is some suspicious reporting. I, I would who, say. I wonder who put that out. It's there. a good question. Yeah. So there have definitely been some questionable things, and I would just say do your own research, but don't end up in that tribal mentality of like this is the person who has to win or everything yes. is bad. I think that's a gr- that's a great way to end. All right, so I hope we have given you sort of good opinions because they're really just our opinions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, about what we think about each candidate's platform and their performance um, at the forum uh, this past week in Philadelphia. Uh, but yeah, as Tyler said, keep reading, keep listening. Let's see what happens in the next few weeks. February tenth is the voting date. All right, so we're not going to do. Scouting Network today Mm-mm. because we have gone very long. It's going to be a, roughly a two-hour show. Yep. We will be back. We'll give you at least 24 hours to digest this show. There's yeah. a lot of audio here. Um, we'll be back, I want to say, late on Wednesday, so sort of late Wednesday afternoon into Wednesday evening uh, with the next episode of the Total Soccer Show. Until then, Taylor Rockwell, thank you for a good week in Philadelphia and for taking the time to talk to me today. Right, I got you, buddy. Listeners, thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you again on Wednesday. <laughs>